All right. Um, yeah, we're being very punctual here. Um, so yeah, just um, I'm starting out just a little bit to, to give you just a quick overview so people have also um, time to catch up for a second. So the plan for today is we're going to have um, yeah two teaching modules uh, in the morning. It's approximately going to be one hour each. And um, yeah, so the thing is, this is actually my first um, virtual course I'm giving. And uh, I have to admit, if I'm completely honest, that I'm not the biggest fan of these online courses. Um, which is mainly from my own experience, because I, I know that when I'm um, when I'm listening into things, like after approximately like 10, 15 minutes, my my mind starts drifting off, and I'm like, oh, I should check my social media. What's up on Instagram? Um, so uh, my idea to to kind of um, get around this is that um, I'm gonna have like shorter submodules. So we're gonna have the big uh, the big uh, half an hour coffee break um, in between those two. But there's also going to be like short, like five minute um, breaks within the modules. So um, instead of having to like, you know, go uh, full steam for like one hour, um, if, uh, yeah, if we can, uh, you know, concentrate on the, on the lectures for like 20 minutes on each, then I promise that there's going to be like a five minute uh, break to you know, visit the bathroom or check Instagram or whatever. So that's how, we, how we're going to do this today. Um, a little bit about uh, the contents. Um, let me see. This is working. Yeah, a little bit about the contents. So we're going to start out uh, very basically uh, in the morning. I'm going to give you like a, a rough introduction, a um, bit of history, and then we're going to talk about drones um, in general, talk about the challenges um, of drones in the Arctic, and then go into the different drone applications that we see. And uh, the second module will be then uh, kind of focusing down on one of the main mission types um, that uh, drones are, are doing uh, in the Arctic right now, and that's uh, structure for motion. Um, and then we're going to talk about a little bit like how would you plan a, a structure for motion mission and what kind of regulations do we have, how do you do flight planning, and also talk a little bit about the infrastructure. And then, uh, yeah, as announced uh, earlier, we're going to change things a little bit around. So we're going to have the field work um, starting right after the lunch break, and then the hands-on session uh, is going to be in the afternoon. Okay, so uh, I hope that gave uh, yeah two or three more minutes for people who who join in a bit later um, to get started. So uh, this is the official uh, you know welcome. So I'm uh, very happy to be able to um, yeah to be here and and talk to you on this topic. Uh, I'm a, a big drone enthusiast myself, um, and uh, I've been uh, involved in uh, working on the Arctic with drones for yeah several years now. Um, so that's me on a typical day in the office. Um, I wish it's uh, not happening that often as I would wish it happens. But yeah, so my name is Richard. Uh, I'm a PhD um, and uh, I'm a postdoc now at uh, NTNU um, and a, a guest researcher at UNIS. Uh, my background is actually in aerospace engineering. So I have very much uh, a problem solving mindset. Um, so, and this has kind of allowed me to, um, to go like in a lot of different fields and, and you'll see that um, I'm not just like dabbling in, in, in one field, but I think as an engineer, what is very nice thing is that you, you, you are really trained to think in a way um, where you look at a problem and then you just try to understand as much as you need to the problem to be able to solve it. And that's kind of like an underlying idea that I also want to take into this course um, today. So I work with uh, drone applications in the Arctic. Um, and uh, my main, uh, one of my main research uh, topics is that I'm, I'm looking at atmospheric icing. Um, we're going to learn a little bit later what, uh, what this exactly is. Um, and I'm uh, doing research and, and designing to kind of, um, yeah, combat this. Um, but I'm also a, a drone pilot myself and I've been uh, involved in, yeah, quite a lot of different, very different um, uh, drone missions up here uh, on Svalbard. Um, looking at glaciers, geomorphology, vegetation, and so on. So I'm hoping that I, I can bring a little bit of experience in these different kinds of applications um, to everybody. So the objective of this course is really to um, enable you um, to plan a, a drone-based uh, remote sensing operation in the Arctic. Um, so the idea here is that I want to, to give um, you the tools and the background understanding of what is needed to, you know, uh, to conduct um, you know, drone field work and, and drone 
um, scientific uh, work uh, in the Arctic. Uh, the main focus is going to be in Svalbard, but it's, it's, it's pretty similar to, to anywhere else. And um, basically, my promise to you is that I, I want to help you to, you know, to be the person in your team or in your group to, you know, pitch this idea. So that the focus is really on this kind of enabling part. Um, I know that, like, um, maybe the groups that you work in, um, you're maybe not so familiar with, uh, with drone operations. You have your established ways of doing things. And drones are very new technology. So I think um, it's, uh, you know, in the... Um, responsibility of us early career scientists, which I think most of us here are, um, it, it's our responsibility to you know, pitch new ideas and pitch uh, new um, incentives, uh, how to improve our research. And drones are definitely um, a, a way to do this. And what I'm trying to do or what I will do is, is to show you like a very simple, like a low barrier um, way to go into this. And of course, you can do Drone-based remote sensing, very complex in the Arctic. Um, you can um, do it uh, very fancy as well, but it's also very simple ways to do that can actually have quite big um, benefits of that. So why do we care so much about um, drone-based remote sensing? Um, and the basic um, yeah, problem to solve, in so, so to say, is that um, in kind of um, modern remote sensing context, we always have this disparity. We have like the ground-based um, field work, which gives you like a very high resolution, like a very accurate assessments of the conditions on the ground, but it's also very limited. It's limited in, in space, you can't cover a large area, and it's also limited in time. You go out you know, once or twice maybe um, a year on a field site, and it's very difficult to maintain uh, long-term monitoring. And that's where, of course, satellites come in, which are exactly the opposite, like satellites that can cover extremely large areas. Um, and depending on the orbits, you, you know, get the coverage of uh, once or, or twice or you know, several times a day or even per hour. Um, and this is, allows you to do like very interesting, like long-term monitoring uh, research. But of course, the resolution of um, satellite-based uh, sensors is, is, is quite limited and it can be quite coarse. So historically, um, aerial, um, applications, so typically this is like, you know, airplane-based uh, remote sensing uh, was used to kind of close this gap in between. Um, and the, the challenge with this is, of course, is this is very expensive, right? You need to uh, employ, you know, you need to rent an airplane, it's very expensive, fuel is very expensive, and then you need to have a whole crew of people to maintain this aircraft and to fly this aircraft. Um, so this is typically very expensive, but also the benefits are very large, right? If you have access to a flight campaign, this can cover also very large areas um, with a very, very good resolution. But, but there's still like kind of a gap um, remaining between, between ground-based uh, research. And this is where, where drones, especially like smaller drones, um, some types of drones that we're gonna talk about a lot today, um, come into play, which kind of help elevate ground-based um, observations to like a higher level and kind of like help to to um, close the gap between satellite-based remote sensing and the ground observations. And we're going to talk about this a little bit as well. Um, larger drones, more complex drones uh, can also be used to actually replace the quite costly, um, you know, uh, aircraft-based um, campaigns um, to a much more reasonable price with potentially even higher flexibility. And I think uh, this, uh, this picture is giving a little bit of an, of an idea as well when it comes to resolutions. So you see, you know, commercially uh, or like openly available satellite uh, data has a resolution of what, maybe 10 to 30 meters, um, while aircraft-based um, uh, observations, yeah, they're like an, <laughs> yeah, more than an order um, of magnitude uh, smaller. And again, uh, these uh, smaller drone-based uh, applications of which we're going to talk today, they are, you know, can have resolutions of one centimeter per pixel. Um, that's no problem at all. So drone-based remote sensing, um, you know, it's very interesting. It offers you the possibility to elevate your, to, your research, to get more out of your field campaigns. And in addition, it helps you to close the, the gap between remote sensing, which in return is giving more you know, value to your satellite-based satellite remote sensing because you can do ground proofing on a larger scale um, and similar applications. So when we talk about the Arctic, 
Uh, why is uh, remote sensing, uh, maybe more generally, but this also includes uh, UAV-based remote sensing, uh, a very relevant topic? Well, the Arctic, as we know, it's a very remote place, and it can be quite difficult and then dangerous to get access to certain areas. So this is, you know, this is one of my applications. I work a lot with glaciers, so we are looking, we're interested at glacier surfaces. Um, here on the left, you can see this is uh, there's a little bit of scale missing, but this is like a 60, 70 meter high uh, wall of ice, which is completely crevassed and um, uh, on the top. So it's very would be very dangerous to walk there to do some observations. But with a drone, we can fly there, for example. Um, and also access to a glacier like this, you have to drive several hours um, to through quite dangerous terrain. Um, so it's it's uh, much easier if you can um, use a flying platform or satellite to, to take your observations. And I think this shouldn't be underestimated, is the Arctic is kind of a pristine place, right? It's not a lot of pollution here. And of course, we as scientists, we are very interested in the, um, in the Arctic, and this is a you know, hotbed for climate research. But we should also think a little bit about the, about the environmental footprint of the work that we do. And you know, instead of going for a you know, lengthy field campaign all the way around Svalbard, maybe in the future, you can just like send a drone, which is gonna be much, much, um, you know, it's gonna have a better environmental footprint than that. So I think in this, I, I hope to, to give you like a, just a rough overview of, um, yeah, where, where we're going, what our motivation is. Um, and um, I'm gonna start out now with a very, very brief history of drones. Um, and uh, then we're gonna look into different drone types and what they mean. So um, drones, uh, yeah, drones is uh, a little bit uh, the common word that people use for this, um, for these machines. Um, there's also a couple of other um, words as they're called, unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial systems, UAS. This is typically um, describing like the aircraft and the ground station in the combination. Uh, also sometimes these are called uh, remotely piloted aerial system or, <clears throat> sorry, or AirPass. Um, and I'm gonna use these terms mostly um, interchangeably. Yeah? So drones or UAVs. Uh, is I think the, the words that you'll find most commonly in, in the literature if you look for things. So very briefly, yeah, the story of drones starts uh, actually uh, quite early, maybe earlier than you would expect it, like approximately uh, in the uh, 1850s, um, the Austrians uh, launched an attack on Venice and they had this, some engineers had this bl brilliant idea that we could, you know, put some bombs on some balloons and let the balloons fly over the city and they would drop their, their balloons and they would start fires in, in the city and then they would um, surrender and come out. Um, this uh, <laughs> didn't quite work out as intended. Uh, most of the balloons actually, because of the wind speed uh, and the wind direction, most of the balloons actually didn't fly over the city, but they flow over their own troops um, and cause a bit of chaos there. But, uh, but some actually reached the city, but they didn't really do any, any damage there. So wasn't maybe the most successful application of it, but it was definitely um, an idea which was born, a very strong idea, which has then, um, yeah, since, since really taken off. A little bit more seriously, um, uh, the idea of drones was developed in the, in the, during the First World War, um, uh, when I think the Brits uh, developed this, um, yeah, an automatic airplane, which they called the aerial torpedo or a flying bomb. So this is basically was a remotely piloted, um, aircraft uh, that had a massive bomb on board. So today we would call this a cruise missile, basically. Um, this was, yeah, not, not, not very widely used, but it was a concept which was out there. And in between the world wars, <clears throat> um, these remotely uh, controlled um, airplanes were further developed. And this is the, the, the Queen Bee um, that you can see in the picture. And the guy in the front, you might recognize him, that's Churchill. Um, and these uh, aircraft has been developed as, as a target drone. So target drone means that um, the, the, the anti-aircraft gunners on the ground, when aircraft are cunning, they needed, uh, when they tried to shoot them down, they needed something to, to train their shooting with. So they needed these targets that fly around that can try to shoot down. Of course, um, an unmanned aircraft was a perfect solution for that. So, so they had this very successful um, aircraft called, uh, I think it was a Tiger Moth, and then they built this remotely controlled version of it called the queen bee. And actually, um, because it's a queen bee and then you know the workers of the queen bee are the drones, um, this is basically where the name drone comes from. 
So that's why I thought it's a bit interesting to, to mention it here. And then uh, in the scope of the Second World War, the Americans uh, developed this like really low cost, um, the radio plane, uh, which was produced in, in very high numbers um, and which was again used for, for mostly for target practicing. And then scope of the Second World War, this Fire B uh, was developed as like the first jet propelled drone, um, again used by the military, uh, mostly the beginning for target practice, but in the end also um, they put like cameras on it and that's when the um, redevelopment of like using drones for surveillance or remote sensing has really taken, taken off. And then in the 1980s, this is like the yeah, <laughs> dark side of, of, uh, of drone images. That's when these modern combat drones got developed. So um, all this, uh, these predators and, and phantoms um, have their origins back uh, in the 1980s. And I think uh, they say that during the um, Gulf War, the Americans had uh, an, uh, one of these drones in the air at all times. So it gives you like a little bit of an idea of how this like simple idea is like, you know, quite exponentially taking off. So I'm gonna leave a little bit to the military um, drone history behind. I had to go through it because that's basically where the origins are. Um, but I think um, very interestingly, and you can see this is like a jump of 30, more than 30 years since the last uh, milestone. Um, we jumped to the, the year 2013, just seven years ago, when DJI, a Chinese company, launched the Phantom One. And the DJI Phantom One was the first consumer grade drone um, that you could you know, buy off the shelf, which was so easy to fly that basically a child can fly it. And this, I think it's really important because there were like some remotely co controlled airplanes before and like some very custom built um, uh, drones that you know universities would be working with maybe. But really this Phantom One, this was like a, a really a pinnacle of technology because it had a lot of smart um, technologies in there which would make it like very easy to fly. And um, they have of course uh, developed this, this product even more and today these things are easier to fly than ever. Um, and this is really unlocking their kind of the civil and the commercial application uh, for the wide masses. And this is also including science. And throughout my, my talk, what I'm gonna try to kind of argue is that really this type of, of, of drone has a very high advantage because it is so easy to access and there's a lot of applications that you can still get out of it, even though it is somewhat limited as we'll see. Yeah, and then otherwise today, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, based on this, there's a lot of commercial applications, you know, using drones for package deliveries or uh, unmanned taxis. And um, yeah, this basically just shows you that like from very simple, you know, uncontrolled balloons, um, we have a really steep uh, development. And, you know, it, it really looks like that, you know, back in the 80s when people or when, uh, yeah, all the sci-fi people back in the day when they tried to imagine how the future is going to look like, um, maybe they were not so far off. So um, as promised, we're approximately 20 minutes in. So uh, I'd like to take a really quick, like five minute break. Yeah, there we go. So let's talk about the different types of, of drones. Um, because, you know, you might be aware that, uh, well, as you can see from this different, from this, uh, from this picture already, that when you say drone, people might not have the same idea of what a drone is. You know, maybe some people think of this really big military drones, or maybe it's like the Phantom, so maybe something smaller um, or in between. Um, and the point is that, you know, drones, they come in a lot of different forms and sizes. It's really driven by the application um, on, on what you want to use them for. If it's maybe something uh, that is designed to, you know, f you know, with military design, it's supposed to fly like around half of the world to do some um, surveillance, or if it's a drone um, that is, you know, supposed to fly very local, uh, just to take some videos. Um, each of these applications will, um, you know, prefer a very specific design. So there's a lot of different things um, and, and, and how they look like. And I think um, we're not going to go too much into the details, but I, I really want to think of two different kinds of drones um, and two categories. And that's basically fixed wing drones. And the other one is the rotary wing drones. So fixed wing drones um, are basically, um, small airplanes, okay? Fixed wing, it means that um, they have this, you know, big wings, just like an airplane, and then some kind of propulsion system, which is mostly a propeller. And uh, these um, drones, they come in, you know, a large variety of, of sizes as well. 
Um, so this is a picture showing you here, just a little bit of a size um, comparison. So the biggest uh, of these fixed wing drones has typically a wingspan of yeah more than 40 meters, which is basically like a small airplane, like a passenger transport airplane, like a you know Airbus A320 or something like that. Um, and then like a lower category is uh, still mostly used for, for so and these big ones they're only military applications. And then we have like the um, category below that. This is still wingspans of more than 20 meters. Um, so this is still mostly military applications of drones. Um, like the Predator, it's like this military combat drone, very famous. Maybe not so interesting for us as scientists. But then like the last three categories, I think this is where it becomes very interesting because this is um, now fixed wing drones with uh, wingspans of, yeah, let's say, yeah, 10 meters or, or less in total. Um, and these are becoming more and more affordable. And um, this is maybe something that, uh, you know, people can afford to use, yeah, especially like, um, the two lowest categories, like something like a like a scan eagle, um, is, is something which is being used for so scientific um, uh, applications, um, and also smaller wings. Uh, we're gonna a smaller aircraft. Um, we're gonna see some examples in the next slides. Um, this is something um, where where we can work with as a scientist because they're kind of affordable. Um, so. With a fixed wing drone, the basic problem is it's it's like an airplane, right? And for an airplane to take off and to take into land, what it needs is a landing strip. So taking off and, and landing is, is a, one of the main problems when it comes to these drones. So there's a different solution out of that. So um, the easiest way to take off with a fixed wing drone is to use a catapult. So uh, this is a video it's taken in New Orleans, and you can see um, this fixed wing drone had like a wingspan of maybe yeah less than two meters. I can show it one more time. Uh, it has a, a camera underneath, and this uh, aircraft can fly for for more than an hour and cover like approximately 100 kilometers. And uh, you can see the way the catapult works is um, it just basically launches the aircraft um, to you know the speed it's required for flying, and you see the pilot behind it, um, and then he he starts controlling the the aircraft. Um, a little bit. Similar idea, a bit more ghetto, is a so-called car launch. So here what you do is you strip your aircraft um, to a car and then you drive the car on a long straight road um, until the, the speed is big enough for the, for the airplane to, to take off. And of course, with smaller aircraft, uh, what you can also do is you can just hand launch them. And um, hand launching, it's, it's kind of an art and it's kind of, yeah, not, 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 yeah it's, it's a little bit between an art and a very hard to learn skill. And the problem is here, it's like, it's really, really hard to learn. So how to throw an aircraft so that you have the right speed um, when it flies off and, and the right direction. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's not really something that you can learn that easily by trial and error because it's, uh, it's um, yeah, quite painful. And uh, even experienced people sometimes have problems with this, which, uh, I think we can see in this uh, little demonstration video, I think it's uh, the Portuguese Marine showing the newest aircraft and yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so, so in types of uh, launching systems, I think the most common uh, used uh, solutions is either using a catapult as we've seen in the first picture um, or with smaller drones, you can still hand launch them, but uh, that's usually done with, with very small maybe, you know, something that's like half a meter in, in, in size. Um, but usually you, you would love to, you would prefer to catapult it because it's much more repeatable and safe. So once the aircraft is in the air, um, the next problem is going to be like, how do we bring it down? So again, these fixed wing aircraft, um, some of them, the bigger ones have a landing gear. So you then just land them like a regular aircraft. Um, but then for this, you need a landing strip. Um, another solution is with uh, smaller and uh, lighter aircraft. Um, like uh, the one that we see here. This has a wingspan of, I think, uh, yeah, also less than two meters. Um, you can do a so-called belly landing. So you see it doesn't have any, any wheels or anything at the bottom of the aircraft, but it's just like, you know, very slowly getting to the, um, you know, very slowly trying to touch the ground. And as you can imagine, this is not something that you can do everywhere. Uh, you can do it very nicely on, on snow uh, if the snow is a little bit soft, but if you have very hard snow, if you have a lot of like sastrugis or if you have a, uh, you know, no snow cover but rocks, then this is not something that you can do without damaging your, your aircraft. So 
Uh, another solution is to, to use a so-called net landing. So uh, the idea behind the net landing is that you uh, put up a net and that you then try to you know, fly your aircraft into this net. So you can see it here, you fly it in and then it's a little bit like a, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, just a fish getting caught in the net. And um, yeah, the impact can be quite high. So it's not uh, completely, sorry. And this is a conventional landing here. That's how it usually looks like. Um, the the nice thing with these nets is that you there you don't need so much space for the landing. So especially if you do like um, field work, uh, so if you do your drone operations uh, from a boat, then you want uh, some kind of a net um, that you can put on the boat and you you try to hit it with the drone. And when I say try to hit it, then you can maybe already imagine it's maybe not so easy. So actually, so in this video here, you can see uh, no, it's not a video, it's a picture. You can see here's the drone, and I think the net is uh, is uh, being held up by this mast. And you need a, a lot of uh, skills actually to to <laughs> hit your target, and you don't want to miss it. And that kind of sums up a little bit uh, the disadvantages and and problems of these fixed wing UAVs. And that's that they really uh, require quite complex logistics and infrastructure. You need this big catapult to to launch it. And you need some kind of area where you, you know, you can safely land. Um, and this is uh, not something that you can just like, you know, do anywhere. Um, and like flying these things is also not too easy. Yeah? There's a lot of different controls. This is, you know, this is an aircraft that has, you know, it behaves a little bit weirdly. You need to build experience for um, how it behaves in order to be able to control it. So you really need um, people who have been working with this for a long time. This is not something that you can pick up, you know, in, in a couple of afternoons. This is, you know, trained pilots who've been flying for like several years um, until they really have the skills necessary to fly these things in, um, to fly these things uh, really reliably. And, you know, just just a story from, <laughs> from my experience with this, I was part of a, um, of a flight campaign up in New Orleans. Um, we were there for 10 days. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, the problem started that it, we, the melt season started a bit earlier, which meant that the runway became wet. So it was like quite muddy, so we couldn't uh, land there. So we were not allowed to fly for the first uh, eight days, I think. And then when finally um, uh, the, the ground got a bit more solid and we could fly, um, we used a catapult to launch our aircraft and we, um, the pilot, he's a very experienced pilot, like he's been flying for several years. But I think it was the first time for him flying up here and was also a new aircraft that he hasn't been flying with so much before. And um, yeah, so we take off and then he flies the first uh, curve and then he loses control over the aircraft and uh, crashes into the ocean. So yeah, 10 day field campaign, um, we got exactly nothing out of it. So that tells a little bit something, what is the, the, the risks um, related to kind of using this kind of complex technology. So I talked a lot about the disadvantages, but okay, why would anybody actually want to use this? Well, the reason is that these fixed wing drones, um, they have a really, really, or they can have a really large range, okay? So it's not uncommon for even the smaller ones to be able to fly for several hours um, and to cover like literally hundreds of kilometers, okay? So this is um, a UV coverage. This is, I think, something, uh, a little bit bigger, I think this is like aircraft with like two meters and a combustion engine um, in it. And they say they can have a, a range of like 2000 kilometers, which basically means you could fly such a drone from the mainland up to Svalbard. Um, so imagine if you want to map, you know, a big glacier or you want to map, uh, you know, large areas of, um, of, of sea ice, then this is really the solution to go. And this comes still at the, the fraction of the cost that than if you would do this with a manned aircraft operation. And the second advantage of these things is that they can carry a lot of weight, all right? So you can put a lot of different uh, payloads on them. And the nice thing is you can just land your aircraft and you can change the payload. If you have a satellite system, of course, then you're very locked in on your type of sensors. But these, um, these fixing aircraft, they allow you to carry a lot of different things. So of course, people are using you know, high resolution cameras, of course. Um, but they also lose, use like, you know, hyperspectral um, cameras that can give you uh, a lot of like information that's used, for example, in oceanography or for uh, vegetation monitoring. You can put LIDARs on it. 
You can even put uh, uh, small radars and SAR um, sensors in it that uh, you know give you very similar data and information um, than a lot of satellites uh, do. So really, the idea of these these things is, is like, yeah, it's very complex to operate them, but once you get to operate them, you really have the advantage uh, that you can cover large areas, uh, you can go to very high altitudes as well, and you can carry a lot of different um, equipment. Okay. So that was fixed wing drones. And then the other type of drone, um, which is maybe a little bit more uh, familiar to most of the you know, um, normal people, so to say, are um, rotary wing drones, or they're sometimes also called multicopters. And basically, the nice thing about these is that most of these, they are so easy to fly that like literally children can do it. Yeah, It's almost like a toy grade uh, technology. Um, except that we can you know, use it for science and, and, and make it work. So they're very easy to pilot. And you, know, you usually have a tab or something like that, or like a small controller, and it's like stabilizing. It has a lot of smart sensors um, that will you know, prevent you from doing anything that would crash the drone. And then of course, because they're basically working like you know, small helicopters, um, you can start and you can land from anywhere. So you can just put them in your backpack. You can walk out into really difficult terrain. You can take off, you can land. You can fly it from, from, from planes, uh, sorry, not from planes, from, uh, you can fly from boats. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility that you can just, wherever your field work is, you can take these um, you know, relatively small um, drones with you and you know, use them right where you are um, uh, and get the benefits from there. Um, <clears throat> so that makes them really, really nice. But of course, the problems is that um, you might have uh, realized that the payload and the range are kind of limited. Okay, so typically um, these drones are able to carry like cameras, like something the size of a GoPro, or today they're actually even a bit smaller, um, which will give you like a very nice like these technologies have been very good. They, this will give you a very nice picture, like a quite you know high definition picture, but. Um, as soon as you want something which goes beyond that, things get problematic. Of course, there's some some solutions uh, now that have like thermal um, sensors, but the resolution of these um, is, is typically quite bad. Um, and uh, as far as I know, there's like some attempts to have like some kind of hyperspectral cameras on this, but they are usually at least the ones that are commercially available now. They're very limited in in kind of the resolution, both in uh, uh, in wave and uh, kind of the, the image size. And then, of course, the problem with these is that the range is very limited. So while it's not unnormal that even like a smaller fixed wing drone you can fly for several hours, um, most of the drones, uh, these multicopter drones, drones that you, you have access to, they fly for like 30 minutes at best. So that also limits of how far you can fly um, with them. And typically, your operational radius is something like one or two kilometers um, at its best. But, you know, the cool thing is, you know, they're cheap. Yeah, you can buy like uh, something like that, a Mavic Pro for like, uh, yeah, $2,000. So that's like, I don't know, 1,500 euros or something like that. Um, they're very cheap, they're kind of replaceable and you can afford, you know, you can afford losing one of these um, without like taking too big of a dent in your, your budget um, for your science. Um, right, so um, trying to, to um, compare these two, uh, summarize this up together. So on the one hand, we have these fixed wing drones. Um, again, they require a lot of, of intensive uh, training uh, to operate this. So typically you, you need to have a dedicated pilot who has a lot of experience with this. Actually, you typically have two pilots flying these things. I um, should have mentioned this before maybe, but typically it's two pilots who fly this. You have one person, controller in his hand, who's actively flying the airplane. And then you have the second uh, operator who's then like planning the mission and then like taking over with the autopilot um, as soon as the plane has started. So it's typically a two-man mission. Um, you can fly them as one-man missions as well, but um, it's a lot of workload for, for a single person to fly these things. Um, and you might want to avoid that uh, in order to you know, avoid crashes. And then again, the problem is that you need some kind of takeoff and, and landing area. So you need a lot of logistics. You need maybe a catapult to take this. And it's just like risky a little bit to fly these. But they're kind of robust as well. Um, I think robust in the sense of um, they can find a lot of weather conditions um, and uh, they can you know, cover this large range and take a lot of different sensors. 
And then the rotary wing UAVs, you know, they're very easy to operate. Um, you can take them off vertically wherever. Um, they're relatively cheap. And on the downside, they you know limited in range and, and what they can carry. And they're also kind of sensitive to the weather, as we'll see uh, just in a little bit. Um, and but but really they are like as low as low entry barrier as they can be. So um, again, a lot of the work and, and things that we're going to discuss today and, and later on is going to be focused on what can you do with like one of these drones that you can basically just like buy. Um, interesting enough, uh, I want to point out um, that something like hybrid drones um, have been starting to emerge over the last couple of years. And so these hybrid drones, um, as you can see here already, it's combining both features. So it basically looks like a fixed wing drone, but then it has these four propellers um, uh, on the frame. And the idea here of them is that you combine both advantages. So that you have something that can like take off and land just like a you know small uh, DJI Phantom or something like that. But then once into the air, then it kind of transforms into a fixed wing aircraft, which then suddenly gives you all these advantages of like added range and um, uh, and, and, and endurance. Um, but these technologies, they're kind of in the, in the, in the making. Um, this is how it looks like. Uh, one of these examples, I think this is Norse flying it. And you can see it takes off um, just like a regular um, multicopter. And then one, uh, once it's in the air, it kind of switches mode and then like starts um, flying like a, like a fixed wing aircraft. Yeah. Right, so uh, I see there has been uh, a few questions, uh, which I think were more related to um, this. Yes, so just um, before we get into the, the, the next break, somebody asked, uh, why not launch fixed wing UAVs just like manned ones? For example, with wheels. Um, and yeah, that's true. You can totally do that. Um, the problem is if you want to launch them with wheels, then you really need a runway. So then you really need to make sure that you have um, like a large area, like a larger like takeoff strip that is really, really flat. And if you have a lot of bumps in this, um, then it's not gonna work. And also you need to have the little wheels, um, like a landing gear on them. And as we've seen, actually most drones that, that I think are more accessible that most people use for scientific um, purpose, um, they don't actually have that because it's just like added unnecessary weight and they do prefer doing a belly landing. Um, and then I think uh, Timur pointed out exactly that. And there's a couple of uh, discussion, which is really nice. And the hybrid is cool indeed. Okay, so um, that concludes this part of um, uh, the section. So I think uh, we're gonna take a, a one more quick five minute break. And so, um, yeah, being right on time and uh, continuing with the next bit. I have noticed there's a few more questions coming in, um, but I really want to get through the next section uh, and I'm going to answer all of them. I promise you, I took some notes um, at uh, the end of this, this module. So, um, so now we learned, okay, so there's different types of drones um, and we, we learned about the advantages and disadvantages as fixed wing drones, um, you know, more complex, but also more potential and uh, kind of the multicopters or quadcopters, which are, you know, more affordable, um, maybe more in the scope of what mo most people are trying to do. So, okay, so let's let's take these drones now to the Arctic. And, la and let's discuss a little bit the challenges um, that you're gonna have uh, in that context. So um, the first and uh, definitely the most obvious problem that you're gonna encounter is the low temperatures, right? It's the Arctic, it's gonna be cold and it's gonna be a problem. Um, so cold temperatures um, are actually both a challenge for um, the operators and the equipment. And, you know, a drone mission typically lasts, you know, 30 minutes. So if you're flying a drone, you're going to have a small little controller with like tiny little um, sticks in your hand that you have to operate for like 20 or 30 minutes. And doing this with gloves is not very easy. Um, and uh, you need, you know, you need a lot of... Um, we call it uh, dexterity to, to, to operate this drone in, in a safe manner, um, especially if you're doing some more, more difficult um, tasks. And also a lot of the, the, the screens that you're gonna use are gonna be touch screens. So 
um, it's definitely a very, very good idea to have um, either some thin, you should definitely have some thin gloves with um, that you can actually use a phone with, or you can also get like this um, pens that work on, on touch screen. So that's a, uh, that's a good thing. And this is really, really tricky. Uh, I was in a, in a drone um, kind of a, a pilot training once where the idea was that they, they fly the drone somewhere out, they put it like you just barely see it and you have to fly it back. And um, it's kind of a, like you're unprepared, you don't see what a drone is. So they tap you on the shoulder and it's like, here, take the controls. And uh, it was a cold day and I had like six gloves on and I forgot to take them off. And then I tried to fly the drone back with uh, these thick gloves and yeah, took an embarrassingly long time and um, definitely uh, tells you to, <laughs> um, yeah, have uh, thin gloves with you and also be aware that, you know, you, you, you need to have the control of the drone drone like all time. You can't just like put on thick gloves and, and, and hope nothing bad happens. Um, and you're not going to move for a long time. So even like I've been doing field work just one or two weeks ago um, up here on Svalbard and it's, yeah, it's plus degrees. It's like plus five degrees. But if you stand, if you don't move for a really long time, you get cold. So it's very important that you um, as an operator are aware of this and you bring like, you know, a ridiculous amount of warm clothes, especially if you do this in the, in the cold season, in the spring, for example. And then the second challenge for the cold temperatures is of course going to be the batteries. So um, it's a, it's a well-known fact that um, cold temperatures and battery capacity um, are working against each other. So the colder your battery gets, the less energy um, you're able to get out of this battery. So this is the main problem because um, basically as a cutoff rule, uh, if the temperature of your battery drops below 15 degree, 15 degree plus, okay, uh, actually a lot of drones or like the DJI drones will not accept the battery. So uh, when you go out in field work uh, and, and, and you try to uh, do this field work uh, in, in, in cold environments, then you need to have some kind of system of keeping these uh, batteries uh, warm. So um, the way that I always do it is um, I'm asking if there's uh, some students who want to join. And of course, these students are very happy to, to join all field excursions. And then you just basically abuse their body heat and <laughs> you put it like into like a thermally insulated bag and you put maybe a bottle of hot water in there. And then you put this bag into the, you know, suit of the, of the student um, and make them your <laughs> walking, uh, yeah, uh, heating device. Um, but um, it, it's also like, even if you do this, um, the, the capacity of these um, batteries is going to be like significantly reduced. So while in, in normal conditions, it's, it's uh, normal that you can fly for maybe 30 minutes uh, with, a, with a, you know, with a charge. Um, now I'm talking again, mostly about like a DJI Phantom or a Mavic. Um, so if you, if you do that in, in cold environments, then uh, yeah, you get 20 minutes uh, out of it or even just uh, 15. So in terms of planning, you should really think ahead and you should have um, always as many batteries with you as you can, you can possibly have. Second problem, uh, second challenge of, uh, uh, for, for drones in the Arctic, it's the high wind speeds. So um, yeah, it can be quite, um, you know, it can be quite windy up here. You can have quite um, uh, weather conditions that are quite rough. And um, high wind speeds are, you know, pose a lot of problems for drones. So first of all, if it's really high wind speed, then um, the drone will not be able to take off. Um, I typically like the cutoff value is like somewhere around like 10 meters per second. Um, and mind you, that's not 10 meters per second of uh, like, you know, average wind speed, but it's like the kind of the maximum wind speed. You can fly your drone at, at, at higher velocities too, but it's not something I would um, recommend you to do. And then also need to, uh, you know that if you uh, have 10 meters of wind speed uh, near the ground, then there's like this, you know, this logarithmic wind profile, if you know a little bit of metrology, which basically takes you that the higher you fly, the higher the wind speed will be. So you have, if you have 10 meters of um, wind speed near the ground, it means that you can have 18 meters, um, maybe in an altitude of 100 meters. And that means if you, for whatever reason, lose control over the drone, or if you lose the position of your drone, then the drone will like fly off with 18 meters per second into a direction that you can't, uh, that you can't control. And if your drone has to fly then into the wind, if it has to fly against the wind, then it's also going to use a lot more energy. So in high wind speeds, um, your battery capacity, which is already reduced probably due to cold temperatures, is going to be um, reduced even more. So um, this, is a, this is really a challenge. And if you like plan your, your field work, you should always like, you know, look on where, where you're going to go and uh, look at the weather forecast and try to um, 
find, if you can, find a slot where wind speeds are going to be low. And, and generally speaking, um, the way to combat high wind speeds is basically to go with bigger drones. The bigger the drones are, the less affected they are by the wind. Um, so the smallest drones, um, I think the Mavic, uh, for example, the Mavic in comparison to Phantom, it's uh, it's going to be, um, uh, yeah, the, the bigger they are, the better it is. Okay, so uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, GPS availability. Um, so a lot of us are wor working with uh, remote um, remote sensing. So you know you know about uh, uh, satellite orbits. So then you know that actually um, there's not that many orbits of satellites that go right over the poles where we want to do our field work. And so this is the ground tracks. I think uh, of uh, all these uh, GNSS. Um, core um, satellites and you can see so this is basically the flight path of the, the satellite over the earth and you can see they don't directly pass over uh, the poles so the, the blue star that you can see there that's um, that's as far about this it's a bit weird map um, but uh, basically what it tells you is that you have somewhat uh, a limited coverage and this can introduce uh, uh, problems both with the accuracy and, and also with the availability of GPS and GPS um, is definitely a, a key uh, component that you need with your drones um, in order to, to operate them safely and, and in a controlled way. And in addition to the GPS availability, um, there's also the magnetic deviation. And uh, uh, this magnetic deviation is larger uh, the closer you get to the poles. And it's also affected by solar activity. So um, some of the drones are a little bit more sensitive to these uh, than others. Um, I, I, I know I have colleagues, they have done actually field work uh, on the north, on the actual North Pole, and they have been flying their um, custom uh, multi-rotors and their, their custom uh, aircraft, and they didn't have actually any problems with, with GPS. They had, a good, they had some good days as well, um, but they didn't have anything. But then if you fly uh, even on Svalbard, which is, you know, um, uh, yeah, below 80 degrees, so it's not even that close to the, the North Pole, if you fly here, um, sometimes you have a lot of problems, and it seems to also depend on the type of drone that you're using. So the Phantom drones, for example, they seem to have a tendency um, to be much more affected by this, and it um, can happen that you fly and you suddenly use GPS, and um, again, if you don't exactly are in control where your drone are, if there's a lot of wind, um, then this can be a really tricky issue. Uh, with the Mavics, we had a little bit more uh, better, better experiences, but anyway, when you do um, this work and you do these operations in the Arctic, you always have to be prepared that you can lose your GPS signal, which basically means that um, you'll have a much, much harder time to, to get your drone back to home because you can't look at the map that you have on these controllers, but you have to really like, you know, fly by seeing your drone. Okay, uh, the next point is, is regulations. Um, and um, there are uh, a lot of different uh, regulations of who can fly a drone and where you can fly the drone and how and, and what you can do with these things. And they are there for a very good reason. Um, because, well, for, first of all, you know, you always have the risk of a drone falling on somebody's head. So you want to <laughs> avoid personal injuries. Um, and also there's a certain risk that the, drone, that the drone can fly very high and, you know, flies into an aircraft, which could be, you know, potentially catastrophic. So, um, you know, the airspace, which is like, um, the area where, where aircrafts operate, it's a highly regulated um, area. So um, the regulations are there to keep you from, um, from flying. And it's a little bit funny because uh, I, I used to give a similar presentation like this, um, I think one or two years ago in, in Canada. And I have um, been talking about all this like challenges and temperatures and, um, uh, and the GPS uh, and so on. And uh, I didn't mention regulations at that time. And my Canadian colleagues said like, oh yeah, that's very nice, but the can you actually fly the drones in Norway? Because uh, in Canada, actually the number one uh, problem is to get a permit to fly. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, you need to be like very aware of what is the regulations um, and uh, of, of where you go and, and what is actually allowed to fly because you don't want to um, you know, uh, break the law because that can be actually really, really dangerous if there's any potential hazard that you are, for example, endangering manned aviation, you know. And we're gonna talk about what are the regulations uh, in the next module a little bit later today, at least when it comes to, to, to Norway and, and Europe. 
Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about is is something that we call atmospheric icing. And um, atmospheric icing is um, just very briefly speaking, is something that occurs when you fly a drone into a cloud. Okay, so uh, in some of these clouds, we can have very special um, meteorological conditions, which means that we have something that's called a supercooled liquid droplet. All right, so that's a droplet which is uh, in liquid state but has a temperature below zero degree. And when, um, you can ignore this, when, when these droplets hit an aircraft, like this could be like a wing or something, then the moment they hit the, air, the, the, the surface, they're gonna freeze and they're gonna build up uh, ice on the wing. So this is also called like aircraft icing. So this is just a picture of how this can, can look like, um, uh, you know, different kind of, uh, Atmospheric conditions lead to different kind of ice, but you can imagine if this is a wing uh, of a fixed wing aircraft or if this is a propeller of a, uh, of a multi-router and you have this kind of um, ice building up, um, even without a degree in aerospace engineering, you can probably guess that this is not a good thing. And actually it's a very, very bad thing. And actually icing uh, is, is very effective of uh, bringing your, um, your aircrafts out of the air, um, especially if you fly a, a, a multi-router, uh, this ice is accumulating very, very quickly on your uh, rotors um, and it's basically going to deny you all the lift and um, you're going to crash very fast. And I mean like this is 90 seconds in that, sco in that scope of, of time frame. Um, and, and so atmospheric icing um, is, is something that's like limiting your flight envelope in the sense that um, if there's a cloud, you don't want to fly into it uh, because you're going to have to run the risk uh, of, of, of this icing. And this is, um, Maybe not so much an issue for uh, you know operations with the the smaller the quad the quadcopter like the DJI type of drones because those uh, you wouldn't fly into a cloud anyway. But if you think again of the little bit like the larger the fixed wing aircraft with a large range where you can fly hundreds of kilometers, um, you probably still don't want to fly into a cloud. But maybe you don't have any means of detecting if you're a cloud into not. So what atmospheric icing is doing, it's, it's, it's limiting your envelope in the sense that, oh, uh, I don't want to fly into conditions I can't see. Um, or if I do, then I'm going to take a high risk that maybe something is going to happen to my aircraft. So um, this is, uh, yeah, these five things are kind of the, um, the main challenges and they're definitely not all equal. And I would, I would say that the way they're ranked here is that the, the challenges definitely are related to your mission complexity, all right? So depending on what kind of mission you're flying and how complex this mission is, uh, you're gonna have to deal with an increasing amount of challenges. Yeah. For most of the, the um, you know, for most of the applications that maybe you're thinking of right now, probably low temperatures and, and the wind speeds, that's gonna be the biggest problem, yeah? Probably also GPS, but usually you're staying out of, of areas where like regulations um, are going to be a major issue or, or icing. But again, if you plan like bigger, larger missions, then you have to take a lot more things into account. Making this kind of like limiting, a limiting factor um, for some really, really cool things now. But what I'm trying to say now is like for simple things, um, the challenges are definitely manageable and it's definitely something that you can overcome. So coming up next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what kind of applications there are for drones. And um, as I said a little bit in the beginning, like kind of my personal mission is a little bit like I want to help people to, to you know, make their research uh, airborne in, in a way. Um, and it's really funny if I go to a conference or if I talk with colleagues and it, it always, um, what we always find out is that almost everybody, like that doesn't matter like what kind of work you do, what kind, as long as it involves field work, we will find some application where it's like, oh, it would be really cool to do this with a drone. So there's a really a wide range of applications uh, for drones, what you can do. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about some applications and then I'm going to go to answer some of the specific questions that you asked me. Uh, we're going to, I, I, it looks like we're going to, yeah, uh, take this um, module a little bit longer, but uh, we still have the half an hour um, break and we just like shift everything a little bit. So one of the applications, um, the people um, are using drones for is like search and rescue. So the idea is that you use drones for, for you know, helping people on the ground to, for example, locate the body or um, to provide communications. Um, maybe not so interesting for us, but it's definitely something that uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, people also Susselmann on Svabert is using. 
Then, of course, big commercial applications. Uh, look at these two guys in, a, in the business suits. Uh, is uh, to use drones for photo and filming. So if you, um, there's a lot of professional people doing this in, in really really cool ways. Um, uh, also up here in the Arctic, if you've seen any of these, uh, you know, recent documentaries, most of it is drone footage. Um, going a little bit more into the science direction, um, uh, one kind of like in between science and, and, and commercial applications is uh, ship-based iceberg detection. So there's a lot of commercial interest, especially in Norway, as you can uh, imagine, is to, to be able to launch a drone from a ship that flies around the ship or in front of a ship or maybe an oil platform that is like scanning where icebergs are and where these icebergs are moving um, in order to uh, uh, enable like safe navigations um, for these kind of vessels in um, you know iceberg infested waters. So the idea is you want to avoid a you know Titanic scenario. Um, kind of related to that is then applications in the field of oceanography and, and sea ice. And here I think the main thing that people are doing is to kind of track um, you know, where is the sea ice uh, edge? Uh, what kind of surface roughness do you have? What kind of ice types do you have? Um, this is, if you think of what kind of drones would you use for this application, this is definitely something where you'd want like a fixed wing drone that can fly over the ocean and cover like a large area. Um, typically with uh, um, uh, uh, like a, sorry, an RGB camera or maybe a, a little SAR um, sensor. There's of course a lot more things that can be done. For example, looking at phytoplankton um, in the in the water column um, or ocean color is also another application. And all of this is kind of like large areas, um, mostly fixed wing drones. Um, atmospheric measurements is another topic uh, which drones are very um, often used, and this is also quite complex missions. So um, this is, I think, from the the recent uh, mosaic uh, ex uh, expedition. So you want to be you want to have uh, a tool that you can use to fly at very high altitudes to fly for example into clouds um, and take some uh, information like what kind of droplet sizes do you have what, what's the temperature what kind of like you know boundary layer conditions do you have um, and for this you really want to use this kind of you know quite small fixed wing aircrafts which are um, uh, able to fly up several um, thousand meters actually um, to take like these vertical profiles. This is kind of in, in a sense similar to a weather balloon, except the weather balloon that flies up to, you know, um, a much higher altitudes, like it kind of, uh, yeah, it's like thousands of meters, while um, the six wing drones, you, you can fly them maybe to 1,000, 2,000 meters in altitude, but they have the advantage that you can reuse them and you can have like a lot of different um, sensors on it. So you see here on the right, this is some kind of cloud probes, uh, temperature probes and so on. Um, and a little bit, uh, sorry, and this, this can also include, include like measurements of like black carbon or aerosols or something like that. And then meteorological observations, um, this is um, something where you want to typically measure like wind, prof sorry, wind and temperature profiles in the atmosphere. And there's like very cool little applications for it. So this aircraft you can see here, that's got a wingspan of like, I think 30 or 45 centimeters, something like that. So very small, very light aircraft that you can use to measure temperature and wind. And you can take uh, like profiles up to, I think one or two kilometers in altitude. Um, uh, very nice uh, application, it's called the SUMO. They use it a, a lot in, in Antarctica, um, but also up here. Um, and then this is uh, mostly the field that I'm working in, in, in glaciology. Of course, if you want to map glaciers, if you want to have an idea of glacier extent, somebody asked me about glacier volumes, then you can use like different types of drone technologies um, to kind of map these things. And this is, I think um, here is kind of interesting, like this is a lot of work you can do with like the smaller um, DJI type of drones, but since a lot of glaciers have really large extents um, uh, or really large sizes, it's definitely a good idea to um, use like larger platforms like fixed wing drones for this. Um, but also, sorry, jumping through this, um, also, you know, people studying Arctic ecosystems, this is one of my favorite applications, using drones to map uh, areas uh, where seal populations are, and they can actually like run image recognition and try to identify seals on ice flows and count them and have an idea of how big these populations are. Um, Vegetation mapping, this is also a very um, interesting field and it's also uh, kind of a big field 
which has been driven mainly by agriculture. So people wanting to use drones to um, understand how the crops and the fields are doing. Um, and they're using this uh, NDVE, uh, which is like this normalized differential vegetation index. It basically tells you what kind of plant types, different plant types you have on the ground, very roughly speaking. Type of a, it's a type of hyperspectral um, camera, multispectral uh, camera that's being used for that. And so there's a lot of really cool um, drone applications we have been developed commercially, which can be, for example, used um, in the Arctic for more scientific uh, purposes to make some kind of vegetation um, assessments of what kind of shrubs and, and, and plants you have in different areas. Um, so geomorphology, um, if you're a geologist or geomorphologist, uh, and you come up to the Arctic, there's a lot of different interesting things going on, like erosion processes, pingos, and so on. So again, this is something that you would map with a smaller drone. We try to get like a you know, high resolution and like a bird's eye view on these kind of features. So um, yeah, trying to, to, to wrap this up a little bit. Um, so this is just a, a summary and you can see like there's a long list of things that you know, drones in the Arctic are being used for today. And I'm sure if you think hard about it, there's a lot more things that we can come, come up with. So summary of uh, this first section. Um, yeah, the starting proposition was that, yeah, drones are an important piece of technology and drones can help to close this gap between the ground-based field work and the remote sensing uh, with satellites. And we've seen that there's like two different types of UAVs. It's like the fixed wing UAVs and the rotary wing UAVs. And they all have the individual individual advantages and disadvantages. And um, the Arctic, it has special challenges that we need to take into account when we do uh, field work here. Um, and it's also, you know, very much related to the individual operation that we can run. And uh, last but not least, like no matter what you do in science, uh, I'm almost sure that you can come up with some kind of application how a drone can enhance your uh, work. All right, so I know I'm a little bit over time, but I still wanna um, come back to some of the questions uh, that have been asked in the, in the chat. So um, let me see. I think the first uh, question, or not the first question, but one question was about, can you use um, uh, drones to measure, for example, ice volume? And yeah, certainly this is something that I think has been done uh, I think I have a colleague who's who's done that uh, on Svalbard on, on one of these glaciers that you kind of try to map um, the, the glacier surface and then if you have a, an underlying a, a DEM, if you have some GPR, then you can definitely calculate what is the volume or how is this volume changing um, relative to that. Um, then uh, somebody asked about, um, yeah, can you fly about uh, above 7,000 meters above the sea level? I'm guessing uh, that's uh, somebody asking about uh, applications of drones in the Himalayan uh, region. And I have to say, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I know, I, I would say that there might be some, <laughs> some issues because the air is getting so thin that the drone might have problems operating. But I think I've definitely seen definitely some, foot, some, some drone videos uh, of uh, somebody working in, uh, in the Himalayan uh, glaciers with drones. So I think it's, 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 it's possible. Um, I don't see, uh, I, I don't know if there's any like hard requirement that it's not, but it would help to look into the data sheets of these drones and quite frankly, just, you know, give it a try. And um, somebody also asked like, how high can you fly a drone? And that, I think as we've seen now, you can probably answer a little bit yourself. It very much depends on the type of drone that you're having. Again, if you're having like a fixed wing drone, like even the small ones, um, they're very efficient flyers. So you can fly up to like one or two, um, kilometers in, in altitude with them. Um, if you have something like a DJI Phantom, uh, you probably don't want to take this more than 500 meters uh, above the ground. And that having said, your maximum altitude is mostly not determined by what your drone can do, but like what you're allowed to do um, as we talk about a little bit more uh, in the later. And somebody also asked, uh, how many backup drones would I bring on field work? Um, <laughs> and I think it's, it's, it's a good question. Well. I would try to bring as much as I can as I have money for. Um, although in practice, of course, it's a little bit of a, it's a balance in between like, what, what would I bring or what kind of backup things would I bring? So if I would have any, any excess money, I would probably rely on my drone skills and try to bring as many batteries um, as you have, because this is also giving you a little bit of um, 
more security. Like I know you go out in the field and you have to fly a mission and you have a certain, you know, you have maybe three batteries and you know, like the three, three batteries, I need to map this area. Um, so if you're very, very tightly planned, then you're going to be very much um, inclined to squeeze the last bit out of the batteries and like fly them to the absolute limit, uh, which is, can get you into trouble if then suddenly, uh, you know, something happens to the drone and you're at 10% battery time left. Um, and that's when, when, when accidents happen. So um, I would say probably the most important thing to bring an extra is, is um, drone batteries and a couple of spare propellers. And of course, if you can afford it, bring an extra um, drone for backup, but um, I, I, I wouldn't say that's absolutely necessary. And I think, um, yeah, I think uh, there's still a few more questions, but I don't want to uh, see I have a, gone a bit uh, further out now uh, in this session. So I'm going to check the chat again and answer the rest of the questions in the beginning of the next session. So uh, we're having um, 10, uh, 15 now. So let's have a half hour break and let's meet again at 10.45. All right, and uh, welcome back. So, um, yeah, let's uh, continue. Actually, before we continue with the second module, um, I uh, want to answer the questions that uh, have been um, posed so far. So I, I try to um, collect them all uh, in the slide, and uh, I hope I haven't uh, forgotten anything. So um, one of the questions was uh, how to cover a large area with uh, limited batteries. And I think that's a question related to using, again, these DJI types of drones. And um, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and basically, uh, you have to do uh, a trade-off between what kind of ground resolution do you have and how high you can fly. And actually, this is going to be something that we've been covering in, 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 this, in this module. Um, so maybe that, that, that should actually give you some idea of how, um, how to solve this problem. And then uh, I've seen there's a lot of discussions about these GPS problems and uh, the drones drifting away and losing their GPS um, signal. So maybe I, I'm going to say um, just a few more words about that. Um, and uh, so there's a couple of things I want to say. So first of all, um, uh, again, I, I, I do know of, of colleagues who've been um, yeah, flying basically near the, the North Pole with their custom uh, made drones and they didn't have any problems actually. So I think um, it's a little bit, the, the GPS problems that a lot of people encounter is maybe not so much um, something that's like a, you know, a, a coverage issue, but you know, sometimes it can be, but it's not most of what's happening. I think um, as far as I understood it, it's a little bit of software problem as, as well, because so the way that the drone works is that the drone has an internal um, has an internal little compass, all right? So the compass of that internal, um, it's called the IMU, the internal measurement unit, is always pointing towards the magnetic north. But as we know, and as I said before, the magnetic north uh, in the Arctic is not um, the same as uh, the geographic uh, north. And the GPS system, that one is providing the drone with, you know, the uh, geographic north. And if there's a deviation between the um, magnetic and the geographic north, so if, if, if there's a difference between the signal coming from the GPS satellites and the signal coming from um, coming from this uh, magnetic compass inside the drone, um, then it's a question of how the software is actually deciding what it thinks is true north. And as far as I understand is that, that in the, some softwares, especially the DGIs, then just simply decide that, oh, I will not trust the GPS. I'm thinking the GPS signal is bad and I'm rather gonna trust um, my onboard uh, compass. So, um, there's, so, so what I'm trying to say is like, it's more of a software problem um, than a technical problem. And, and I know that some people are looking into this. I know this is Swedish research group um, trying to find more about this because um, this is not just in, in, in the Arctic a problem, but also at higher latitudes like Norway and, and, and Sweden. Um, in my personal experience, I've been mostly flying um, the Phantom 4 Pro, and that one is quite, um, yeah, it's, it's quite sensitive to these things. It, it can be that you go out and you fly, uh, you know, two days straight without a single problem, and then on the third day, same place, um, you're running into a lot of problems. And I think that could be related to maybe um, 
kind of um, activities of the magnetic field. Um, uh, recently, we've been using a lot of the Mavic uh, 2 Pro um, Enterprise. I think that's uh, what we're using at, at Unis. And with that one, we had actually very little problems so far. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a recommendation that can be. Um, but GPS problems can also come from other things. If you transport your, your drones in the, the plane and they get scanned, for example, with the X-ray, that can actually affect, uh, can, it can magnetize. Um, your drone actually. So that's, uh, I also heard of people who had some problems with that. So yeah, not an easy issue to solve. Um, and just something that we, at least for now, have to have to kind of, yeah, work around and, and try different um, solutions and, and, and make it work for, for us. And then somebody asked if there's a, can, if I can recommend a good paper on uh, how to build DMs from drone data. Um, I don't have a paper um, right here, but this is exactly what we're gonna do in the hands-on session this afternoon. So I think that's gonna answer your questions. And if not, we can discuss it more. Uh, also, somebody asked if uh, I know of any literature or research uh, using drones to detect the red algae on glaciers. Uh, and I don't, but I think it's a really cool uh, project. And I think that's um, a prime example of how uh, drones can be used actually in, in a really nice way to, um, to, to, to extend this research to, um, to a higher level, so to say. And then somebody asked if I can comment on using drones and GPR. So GPR, that's a ground penetrating, penetrating radar. Um, so it's kind of a radar that's used to look either into the ground or under the snow surface. Um, and I do know, uh, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's a Canadian company, but there's a, there's a company that actually built kind of a GPR that you can attach to one of the bigger DGIs. Um, and fly that. Um, I, I have not any you know, experience with them, but, but I read about it. And um, so that this technology exists, I'm pretty sure it's, it's quite expensive. Um, and also uh, it's gonna have the problems of all uh, airborne based uh, GPR, so to say, which is that you need to fly very, very close to the ground. So um, this is gonna be very um, demanding uh, operations for sure. Um, you, you'd want to stay probably, you know, below five meters uh, above the ground. So you need to have a good control on your drone and you have to you know, have a good uh, evaluation model available when you plan your, your flights and uh, yeah, good GPS. And um, definitely possible, but definitely that takes a lot of uh, precautions and, and, and risk analysis. Okay, so um, um, yeah, continuing with, uh, with the main topic, um, and again, I want to come back to the motivation of the talk, which is again uh, for for enabling you to really for read really to plan and to conduct your own um, you know drone based remote sensing operations in the Arctic. And and for this, um, I want to get into a topic which uh, is called um, drone based structure for motion. And I know that uh, yesterday uh, Luke uh, talked about something very very similar. So um, there's going to be a little bit of overlap. Um, but I don't think it's going to be too much, and it might be also interesting um, to hear another um, kind of perspective um, on the same topic than him. Um, and um, then we're going to talk a lot more about kind of how to make flight planning, what's the more detailed questions you need to answer. And then this afternoon, we're actually going to use, um, we're going to have a hands-on session where we're going to use this method. And the reason that I choose um, structure for motion um, as, as a hands-on is basically because that's, I think, probably 80% of all applications use that. So if we, if we look at the list from before, um, I think all the ones that I highlighted here, these are um, the applications that would rely to some degree on uh, structure for motion technique. So without further ado, um, Let's uh, have a very short introduction of, um, yeah, structure for motion for, for dummies, I wanna call it actually. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. So structure for motion or uh, F, uh, SFM is a photogrammetric technique for estimating three-dimensional structures from two-dimensional image sequences. So you estimate a three-dimensional structure from two-dimensional images. All right, let's try to put this into a more visual form. So the idea is that I have some kind of feature of interest. And then I take a series of 2D images. So, you know, an image I can take with a camera. So I can take the camera, I can walk around my, my feature of interest. Um, 
and then I apply some kind of uh, black magic uh, technique and my final product will be some kind of a 3D model. And uh, this is by no means actually a recent invention. Uh, and, and I really love this picture somehow. Uh, in uh, already uh, 1685, uh, Johann Zahn, I think it's a German uh, priest, described this technique that if we should ever see a dragonfly over a city, we would be able to like describe exactly how the dragon looks like if we have like several observers um, that would look at it from different angles and then we can like get an understanding how this dragon uh, would look like. So the idea for this technique is actually quite old and it was actually documented well then, but it's only in the recent, uh, yeah, modern times that it has been really brought to um, a method that's scientifically uh, or like, yeah, commercially used. Um, but yeah, it's it's not an old, it's not a, it's not a, you know, not a no novel technique. Actually, the way that our brain and our our vision works is the same thing. You have the left eye, which takes a two-day, uh, two-dimensional view, and the right eye, which has a two-dimensional view, and then our brain, this amazing machine, just like puts these two images together and gets you a, a 3D image out of it. So, taking this a little bit to a more um, technical level, so what is it that we do? So. Structure for motion works in a way that you have a 3D model. You have this, um, the, the, the right, uh, the red uh, 3D model, and this model has different features. And now we take a camera <clears throat> and we move uh, this camera around the object and we take several images. Um, and within each of these image, we will have the same kind of, of, of features, right? Um, and then we just try to match it, okay? We just like try to find out uh, if on my first image, I have this feature, where do I find the same image on uh, the second image, right? So it's always about this kind of this feature tracking or edge tracking. And then we take a lot of like mathematical equations into it to then kind of like, you know, calculate where's the position of my camera. And then if you understand where your camera is, then you kind of kind of reverse it and you can kind of describe um, the 3D model. Um, we're not gonna jump into the equations, of course, but um, I, I can provide you with some literature um, in the end that uh, gives you some further reading if you're interested. So in a more practical sense, okay, if I have a cup um, and I want to have a 3D model of this of this cup, okay, I'm going to take a lot of pictures from it around and I'm always like, I'm going to try to find some kind of a pattern, some kind of a feature. Um, it can be an edge um, or something that I, I find on multiple pictures and I can then just link it together. And uh, I think I want to show this, hopefully this is going to work. This is a short video. Um, let's see. Yeah, called the Structure for Motion Pipeline. So again, the, the workflow, very simple. You take a lot of pictures of something. This is a castle in Ödebu, uh, Sweden. So this is your feature of interest. Then you walk around and you take a lot of pictures um, of this. And then the second is, this is the black magic part, is that you process these images in a way and you try to identify some kind of features. And these features can be like edges or corners. Um, and if you've identified these, then you now try to like match these, like where's the one, uh, you know, where's the corresponding points on the other images? It's going a bit fast, but yeah. So you can see here, um, yeah, wait a second. This is not, uh... Can I jump back? Okay, I should, uh, sorry, my computer is very slowly dealing with this video, so I will not stop it, but um, I will send you the YouTube link so you can have a look at this again. But the idea is again, so you have these features, you track the features, and then once you know what the features is, you can kind of calculate um, where these features are in relation to your uh, pictures, and then you can kind of recreate um, the, the object. So you get like this kind of point cloud out of it. And yeah. So this is typically how, how the product from such a uh, method would look like. You see the yellow little dots, it's the uh, locations where you took the pictures from. And then each of the dots in the middle of the picture, that's representing one of these features that has been tracked and that has been put into a certain place in time and space. And what you can see clearly is that, of course, areas where you did not take any pictures of you also do not have any points. So in, in for our castle, um, that's gonna be of course like the roof. So 
Um, what you can do is like after you have these points, you can like build a mesh around it and you can kind of project the images on it. So then you get like this really nice colorized 3D model. And um, I think the, the the main idea here is you can see is like, wow, you know, all we did is we go, took a bunch of pictures and, you know, we got a, a 3D model out of it. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. Um, and you can see here also the limitations again, areas which are not well, uh, where you don't take pictures of or which have um, very bad, uh, which are very, uh, don't have any features, are very difficult to track. Okay, let me see if I can get out of this. Okay, so um, I think it was established uh, more or less that structure for motion, it's a pretty cool technique and it's actually a pretty powerful technique. Like all you need to do is to take a couple of pictures of something and you can get a 3D model out of it. So um, if we combine this, uh, this method um, with a UAV or a UAS system, then we actually get something extremely powerful because the UAVs allows us to get like to take a you know to take a, a large um, to get this aerial overview and to cover a large area. So some of the the areas that um, the UAVs in combination with photogrammetric methods are being used are, um, for example, in construction sites. Actually, this is one of the biggest commercial applications uh, where people use drones to basically keep track of like how's our construction site going. Um, you know, which parts are finished, where's the problems. Um, and one sub part of this is actually like a stockpile um, monitoring. So uh, in a construction site, you have a lot of stockpiles, for example, earth that you dig out that you have to transport off. So you can then, you know, use a drone, take a couple of pictures, get an idea of the size of this, uh, uh, the heap of um, the volume of, uh, of dirt that you want to transport off. And then you can calculate how much trucks you want. And the person who asked about, uh, yeah, can you uh, measure glacier volume with this technique? The answer is, of course, yes, because it's in principle the same um, idea that's uh, been done here with stockpiles. Um, if you combine uh, not an RGB image, but you can also combine uh, thermal images or um, some kind of multispectral cameras, and you can still stitch these pictures together in the same way. And then you get, um, uh, like in agriculture, you can get an idea about the status um, of your crop field. And you can see here, I don't know what the, um, I don't know exactly what this is, but I'm guessing like the red areas is areas that have been maybe damaged. You can see all the tracks of the tractor driving here. Um, and maybe there's some, some yeah, uh, it will help you basically plan and irrigate your, your field. Um, another popular application is also um, like mapping for, for geohazards. So this is uh, some river in China and you can then kind of identify, okay, so where is the, the areas where you would have, example, have flooding or the areas where you'd have high erosion rates um, and how does this um, affect, uh, yeah, buildings and infrastructure. Of course, you can use this method also to map like, towns, make like very high uh, resolution uh, maps of towns. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is what I'm working on. I'm working on glaciers. Uh, so I fly drones and glaciers to learn uh, more about uh, the crevasses. And so typical outputs uh, are, um, something, uh, something like that. All right. Um, I think um, I think we are we're not taking the break. I think we only uh, took us. Uh, yeah, actually, it took us. Uh, yeah, seventeen minutes. So I still want to take a break, actually, because it's a kind of nice to to have the mental pause here. So let's take a quick five minute break. Maybe we just make it four. And we continue at uh, 11, uh, at six past 11. So let's, um, let's continue. Um, and um, yeah, now we talked a little bit more of like, kind of generally speaking what people are doing, um, but I wanna start being a bit more specific and I wanna start talking about things that you need to take into account if you want to plan your own field work. Um, and um, I want to, yeah, basically tell the story of, uh, of my first uh, drone work. Um, so that's me. That's, uh, I think, the first time um, I went to a glacier and I flew a drone. Uh, I was really excited. I had been flying drones before and I knew a little bit about glaciers. And then I had this opportunity to go on this project and, and fly my drones and take pictures of, of glaciers and glaciers crevasses with the idea of mapping them. But to be completely honest, I had no idea what I'm really doing. I, I went out there and I'm like, 
when I was out there and starting to fly the drone, I'm like, okay, what am I actually trying to do? It's like, okay, I tried to take pictures and I knew I wanted to do photogrammetry, but I didn't really had any plan of, of what I wanted to do. So I was like, I flew around and I tried to map the glacier. Uh, I tried to get like the crevasses closed up, but really um, I was just like, you know, messing around and uh, it was a nice trip. But when I get the data home, I think uh, I was able to maybe recreate the, uh, maybe like 20 times 20 um, uh, meter area of the glacier, which is uh, in comparison um, to this, uh, yeah, massive piece of, uh, yeah, uh, wonder of nature <laughs> was a very, very tiny uh, thing I actually managed to do. So the problem here was that I, I didn't do my homework. Uh, I'll be completely honest, um, because the first thing that you should really, really do um, before you go out and do any fieldwork with drones is you should, you know, sit down and really, really think hard about what is it, like, why do you want to go out and what is it actually that you want to get out of it? <clears throat> because as we'll see um, uh, through the next slides, but also actually from what I've talked uh, from today, the kind of the, ch the choices that you have to make, the choice, of course, which kind of drone you use um, from where you're going to fly, how you're going to fly, how high you're going to fly, what kind of sensors you're bringing, it's very much going to be um, uh, driven by what you actually want to achieve. It, it sounds a little bit like uh, I'm saying something very, very obvious here, um, but I think in practice, I've, I've often you know, experienced that people are like, okay, let's go out, fly the drone, and then they ask, oh, how, how high should we fly, for example? What kind of overlap should we have? Um, how should we plan our flights? Um, and I didn't think about this before. All right. Um, so it's really, really important that you understand like what kind of requirements you have. What is the product? What is the product that you want at the end um, going to look like? What kind of resolutions will it going to have? So I believe um, the next things are a little bit of a repetition of um, what you've uh, learned yesterday uh, with, uh, with Luke. Um, and so the first question that you have to ask yourself, what is the ground resolution that I need? So the ground uh, resolution, or in this terms, it's often referred to the ground sample distance. It's basically um, the equivalent of what kind of size um, one pixel in your camera has, what it corresponds to um, on the ground. All right. So um, you've maybe seen something uh, similar like this yesterday. Um, depending on how high you fly, uh, the ground sample distance is going to be different. So this is two cases, left and right. You see, this is a very simple camera. It's a three by three pixel camera. So in the left case, where the drone is uh, flying at a lower altitude, um, the ground resolution uh, would be three centimeters, all right? Um, if you have the same camera, same drone, but you fly at a higher altitude, um, then these pixels, they're gonna blow up on the ground basically, which means that you're gonna cover uh, a larger area. So what this basically tells you that once you've decided for yourself, okay, my ground sample distance that I need for my product is maybe 10, 15 centimeters or something like that. If you know that, then you can go in and you can just calculate, okay, so what is the maximum altitude um, that I can fly? So you can calculate this um, quite easily. Uh, all you need to know is uh, you need to, if you want to, uh, if you want to know what is the ground sample distance is, all you need to know is the altitude above ground of your, your drone. Um, you need to know what kind of camera you, you use, what is the, the width of the sensor, um, how many pixels it has, and the focal length. And this is then a very, very simple um, calculation. I have an example here. Um, you can get these calculators online if you, um, if you want, but of course, it's very easy to do it yourself. So this is an example for, I think it's a Phantom 4 Pro, one of the drones that I'm using. And um, you put in, again, all the information of the camera, how high you fly, and then you can... Um, calculate the ground sampling distance. So in this case, I'm flying my drone 60 meters above the ground, which means that I would get a resolution of approximately 1.6 centimeters um, on my pictures. And of course, if I fly higher, like let's say I fly double the height, it's a linear relationship. So then my ground sampling distance would double as well. So that's the first thing that you need to kind of decide. The second uh, thing that you need to decide is, okay, so how is actually my flight path gonna be? So typically what you do is you have some kind of area of interest. Yeah? That's the green area here in the background. And if you want to map this area, then you need to have some kind of flight pattern, this kind of meandering path uh, over your area of interest. 
And you have to decide how am I gonna, how this is gonna look like, like how many pictures I'm gonna take uh, in uh, along the flight path and how uh, is the spacing gonna be between these two um, parallel paths. And this is gonna affect uh, something that we call the overlap. So the overlap is basically means of two consecutive, if the two pictures, how much, um, you know, how much do they cover of the same area? And there's two um, key overlaps that we need to take into account. The first is the frontal overlap, and the second is the side overlap. So the frontal overlap is an overlap that we get uh, in direction of, of flying. And we can affect this either by flying slower or uh, faster, and we can also affect this uh, by how often do we take pictures. Talking about DJI drones, these uh, have um, built in um, a, a limitation of how often they can take, they can take pictures. So the lowest interval that these can take pictures is every two seconds, all right? So if you know this and you know how fast you're flying, then you can basically calculate what your frontal overlap is gonna be. Um, and then in addition to the, the frontal overlap, we have the side overlap, which is basically gonna be um, uh, given by the distance between two of these parallel lines. So this is um, uh, nicely kind of um, summarizing the idea of like what like, different uh, overlaps uh, look like. So 0% overlap, none of the pictures have any connection to each other. A 20% overlap is they have some connection to each other and the 70% is that they are like mostly covering each other. And this is very important to, to set as a parameter for your study. And it's again, it's, it's driven by what you want to do. If you want to make a 3D model of something, okay, then you need a very high uh, overlap because there's a lot of like, you know, elevation that you need to capture in this. If all you want to do is just like a, a top view, like an autophoto picture, like basically this is just like a big, uh, like a big panorama picture that you stitch together from a lot of pictures, then you don't need a lot of overlap. Then you basically have to make sure only that there's some connection between the two um, pictures and you can uh, actually live with a lot less um, than 70%. Um, and of course, you want to make sure that you have enough overlap, but you also want to make sure that you don't have excessive overlap. Um, excessive overlap will lead to the situation that you're going to take a lot of time to process your data. Um, and also you're going to waste potentially a lot of um, battery power uh, of, you know, if you, t if you take your grid, um, your flying grid is too, co uh, too fine, that means that you're going to spend a lot of um, uh, battery power that you shouldn't have uh, used. Um, that having said, it's typically the side overlap, which is a little bit more critical and which you need to pay more attention to. Um, the forward overlap, um, if you take pictures every two seconds and you take a little bit too much pictures, that's no problem because you can sort them out in the end. But you really want to make sure that your side overlap is, is in a good margin. And that leads to the, <laughs> the age old question in photogrammetry is like, what's the right overlap? Like how much should I choose for my study? And again, it's, it's not something that can be answered in a very simple way it is very much depending on your application. And in general, what you can say, the more overlap you have, the more 3D details you will be able to capture. So this is um, just an example of uh, a couple of trees that are um, being photographed with different overlaps um, all the way on the left. You can see you get the most details if you have a 95% overlap. Um, this is gonna be a lot of features, it's gonna be a lot of processing time, but only this is able to get like this very, very fine details um, of like the leaves and like this very complex uh, and fine 3D model. But again, if you're interested in, in, in trees, 3D modeling, then yeah, then you'll probably need like a 95% overlap. But if you are fine with something more coarse, then of course, 80% overlap can be more than enough. So once you decide on the overlap, um, then you have to go back to your path planning and you have to take a couple of things into consideration. Um, unfortunately, when we fly, um, the elevation, you know, we don't fly over flat area. So we're going to have some kind of underlying uh, elevations um, that change. And very often we're going to fly in areas where we actually don't have um, an elevation map or we have just like very rough understanding of how the ground is looking like. Um, and that's going to be a problem for us because as you can see here, uh, a variance in the elevation is going to affect two things. It's first going to affect our uh, ground sampling distance because now suddenly the altitude is changed. So if there's a, a little bump, that means that in that case, our um, resolution is gonna be much, much finer, which can be fine, that's not a problem. Um, but if it's a valley, then it's the opposite. Then you get a coarser 
uh, resolution, which might be too big. And the second is, of course, that the overlap is going to change. So that's you can see here is the red and the, and the yellow bar. You see that uh, in the corners of it, this the shaded area uh, on the left side is going to be much bigger um, than on the right side, where it's the, the lower elevation. So this is another way of looking at it. So imagine you have this case, you have the drone taking pictures, you have 60% front and side overlap. Um, you have a very good stitch, very good data. And now you have a little hill or a little stockpile, uh, which is just so big that your um, overlap is reduced to 50%, which means that you get just barely enough um, information to, to uh, determine the altitude of it, or the elevation of it. But if it's um, something higher, then your overlap is going to drop below 50%. Um, which means that you can't you can put the pictures together and you get like an auto map, but you can't make any information about the 3D structures um, or the elevations of it. And then if there's like some trees or some houses that are gonna even reduce the distance between the camera and the ground, then you can get into an area where you get suddenly no stitches. So again, you have to be very careful of of what you um, map, and you have to choose your um, altitudes um, uh, accordingly. So typically, what I would do is, is I would think, okay, so which is the kind of the, the band that I want to fly my drone in? So the maximum altitude above the ground that can fly, which parameter is that given by? And what is the minimum altitude above the ground given by? I'll give you like half a second to think. Um, so again, just to summarize, the maximum ground resolution, resolution that I can accept, that's going to tell me what's the maximum altitude I can fly. And the minimum overlap that I can accept, that's going to tell me the minimal altitude I can fly. And that's typically going to give me a band that I can fly in. Um, and I will then, depending on what my, my goal is, typically try to fly as high as I can. Because as high, if I fly high, then I can cover a larger area, which means I can um, you know, have a larger uh, area I can map. Right. Um, a few things you can do to improve um, your results. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because I think uh, Luke touched on this. And that's um, uh, basically two methods um, that you can do to improve um, the accuracy of your maps. And the first is to use ground control points. So um, in the idea of this uh, structure for motion, um, you know, we take a couple of pictures and we know where our cameras are because we get a GPS tag, which each of our pictures that we take. And then we like put everything together um, and then we get a 3D model, and then we know from where the cameras has been posed from our GPS, we kind of know where this entire 3D model is going to be. And to be honest, this is actually surprisingly accurate. I think, um, at least for, for what I've seen, you usually get an, an accuracy of like plus minus half a meter, at least in a, in a horizontal um, distribution. It's a little bit more tricky if you want to accurately or absolutely capture um, elevation with this kind of approach. So this is where you can add ground control points. So the idea of a ground control point, that it's um, a location in the area that you want to map where you are um, have a high confidence of the coordinates. Now, typically, you would go in with a differential GPS and measure the location of, this, of a point, and then put some kind of a marker in that you can later identify in the pictures. So one way of looking at this is, if you just like fly without any ground control points, then you get a, a 3D map which is kind of like a, you know, a little bit wobbly, kind of an elastic, um, you know, sheet of, uh, of uh, let's say, bed linen or something like that, a piece of paper, okay? And these ground control points, you can then kind of take them to pin them down to kind of like fix some locations um, of this model uh, in, in space. And that's kind of going to give you like a much, much better um, accuracy. But then the question is like, okay, when do I need to use this, right? Then the answer to this is again, well, depends on your application. Are you really worried if your uh, coordinates are like one or two meters off? Is this going to be a problem for you? Are you trying to measure something in your model? And if so, like what kind of accuracies uh, can you accept? Does it, is it really important that it's, um, you know, you need to find something out that's in the millimeter range or centimeter range or meter range? Um, so it really, really depends on what you want to do. And we're going to talk maybe a little bit later in the hands-on on, on which are cases where I would recommend you to use ground control points and, and which are not. And we can all also discuss this if you have some questions about this. So ground control points are one way to increase, uh, increase the quality of your point. Um, the second is something uh, to use this real-time kinematic method. So 
the picture that you see here, this is the normal case of how we operate the drone, all right? We have a drone and the drone is communicating with uh, the operator via the ground controller. And then the drone itself is communicating with the satellite and the satellite is telling the drone its location in space. And as we know, GPS has a certain limitations when it comes to accuracy. So that's gonna be also the limitations of the accuracy that the drone will know. But if we add a ground station, a so-called RTK uh, base station, um, that has a known location because it uses a uh, differential GPS, then the drone can figure out um, its distance to this ground station, which will then help it uh, immensely to improve uh, its accuracy in, in time and space. So in applica applications where this is like very important, uh, for example, in stockpile measurements, uh, when you want to know, okay, how much of, uh, uh, how much, um, uh, if I have a heap of, I don't know, coal or dirt, and I want to transport it away, and I would really want to know how much is in there, then this is, for example, very important that you have like, a very accurate um, solution. These systems are unfortunately very, very expensive, um, or I think now they're just very expensive, um, but they are commercially available on the market. So you can just like go ahead and, and buy like a base station and a special drone for this and, and, and fly it. Okay. So this is um, being the block on uh, kind of, you know, how, how to do this and how to process the data and what you'd have to take into account to kind of make a flight path. Um, and this has mostly been driven by what you want to achieve with your drone flights. Um, one limitation are the drone regulations that I uh, pointed out with, okay? So you have maybe an idea that, oh, I need to fly, you know, 800 meters high, um, but the question is, can you do that? So drone regulations are there to make sure that drones operate in a safe manner and safe in terms of you don't um, endanger any other humans on the ground and you don't endanger any property in the ground and also that you don't have any interference uh, with the airspace that you, know, you don't want to crash into a helicopter or you don't want to crash into an aircraft because that's going to have really, really bad um, uh, results. Uh, I have a colleague of mine, he works... Um, uh, he's worked uh, or he's working on a uh, uh, very fun project. What he does is he builds a big cannon and then he loads this big cannon um, with uh, a phantom drone and then shoots this big phantom drone onto a wing of a <laughs> commercial aircraft and then he sees what kind of damage he done. Um, and basically he says, yeah, it's not very good. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of damage, which is going to you know, potentially crash an aircraft. And uh, you know from the news that people are very afraid of, of this scenario that an air, uh, a drone is flying into an aircraft and then crashing it. So for that reason, there's very strict regulations of where you can fly and when you can fly, and, and you need to follow these. So um, for a lot of applications, um, the, the rules can be actually quite simple, all right? Um, and, and so this is the, the, the most simplest rules, which is like the easiest flying, which don't require any major, um, you know, hoops you have to jump um, to get like special permits. Um, and that's the first of it, that you always need to see your drone. Okay, very simple, um, uh, very simple rule. It basically means, okay, you always have to have eyes on your drones. And I think this makes a lot of sense because, you know, you lose your GPS signal, you need to be able uh, to bring your drone home. Yeah, of course you can use the, the video feed that you get, but maybe you use that too. So how do you do that? So this also means that typically you are very limited to nighttime operations because can you see the drone really? And it, this also gives you some limitations of how far you can use, can you go. And it's a little bit of a gray area, but the question is also like, what does it mean? Can you see the drone? Can you use binoculars to see a drone? Um, can you, you know, if you see yourself in the drone with the video, is that it? So um, it's a little bit, um, yeah, there, there's some, some gray area. So let's put it that way around. It's very easy to, to, to slide into some gray areas here. Um, but um, you need to be sure that you have some control over the drone, that you actually um, are able to pinpoint its location. If you, you know, lose your GPS, if you lose the video feed, that you're able to bring it back home and, and don't bring it into any dangerous situations. Um, and the second um, limitation is that you are not allowed to fly higher than 120 meters um, above the ground level. So at all points, your drone should uh, never be flying higher than 120 meters. And this is also typically an altitude from which on you kind of lose the drone uh, in, 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 you can't see it anymore if you fly much higher. Um, 
And this is clearly a limitation that is avoid uh, that is there um, to avoid any interference with any um, aviation. Um, the next regulations is you are not supposed to fly uh, over people um, or inhabited areas uh, with drones that are way more than 250 grams. If you have a drone that's less than 250 grams, um, there's a few of them out there. Um, you can use those um, to yeah, fly basically over people or houses. Um, but for, for most drones, all the bigger drones, all the DJI Phantoms and Mavics and so on, um, you're not allowed to fly them over people. And uh, as such, you also have to keep a distance of 150 meters um, from, uh, from buildings and, and like any uh, places where, where people could be living. And I guess this makes sense, right? We don't want our drone to accidentally fall on somebody's head. Um, and then uh, kind of a special regulation as well is that um, you also have to keep your distance from uh, an airport. And that's typically five kilometers um, that you have to stay away from any point of the runway. And this is again intended that you don't get into any issues um, with that. So uh, if you're intended, intending to do you know, flights on, on, on longer beam, this is just like, uh, this is basically showing you the area where you're allowed to fly and where you're not allowed to fly. And this is often, um, you know, covering, for example, this is covering most of Long Yabin. So if you want to fly within this red area, you have to get a special permission um, from the airport and you have to notify them that, that you can do that. So uh, all these regulations that I've, that I've showed, okay, this is um, basically, this is, if you stay within this, you can pretty much fly um, without a lot of, um, without doing a lot of administration. You still have to register your drone. You still have to register yourself as a pilot. You still have to, um, ensure your drone. Um, but other than that, you are uh, almost always allowed to fly within these conditions. And if you don't exceed any of these limitations that, you, that we just uh, said, then things become a little bit trickier. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I want to go too much into, into detail that, um, but we can talk just a little bit of um, uh, that. But I think if there's a question, I can talk a bit more about that. Otherwise, I'm not going to do into it. Um, and just, just one more word, like uh, all of these rules I presented now, they are the national rules of Norway that apply in Svalbard. Um, but there has been an initiative from the EU to actually make all of these drones, because every country has their own laws, to make all of these rules into uh, a common um, set of laws. So this is called the EU drone laws. Um, and they actually were supposed to start uh, this summer, but because of Corona, they didn't. So the new timeline is, um, that uh, until the 1st of January, uh, every country is going to have their own uh, rules. But starting from that, um, uh, these new EU drone laws are going to apply. And they're gonna also going to apply in, in Norway and on Svalbard, even though um, it's not, a, it's not a part of the EU, but they just adapt this, this, uh, these rules. So um, until next year, you can fly under the old system. Um, uh, it's going to be like a transition period where both the new EU uh, drone laws are going to be applicable and uh, also the old Norwegian ones. Um, and then from uh, 22 on, uh, only the uh, new EU drone laws are going to be um, applicable, expect, uh, except for the specific drone operations, which are going to be like, you know, fixed wings, flying very high and so on. So from 2023 on, only EU law is going to be um, applied. And the nice thing is that this is actually, I think, really good for a lot of international collaborators because right now it's actually kind of difficult to do especially more complex um, drone operations on Svalbard because you have to take a drone exam in, uh, in, in Norway. Uh, you have to pass this exam and you need to some kind of um, you know, certificate that you are um, able to do these things um, if you do more complex things again. Um, in the future, if you do it once for the EU, you can use it everywhere. So that's going to be a really nice thing. Um, and again, the basic drone operations. So most of the simple things are going to be are actually almost identical to the same rules that we had. So it's like 120 meters, um, always within visual line of sight. All of these rules, these are going to be um, still applicable under the new new regulations. But um, yeah, I just wanted you to be aware that that's something uh, is coming. So yeah, I think uh, it's time uh, for another uh, five minute break. So yeah, so let me start um, talking a little bit again about flight planning. So if I wanna make my flight plan, if I wanna plan my field work, uh, what's the first thing that I need to take into account? So I need to talk about, I need to decide on the altitude, how high do I wanna fly? And this is gonna be determined 
by this ground sample distance that I can live with, and also by the ter terrain features. Um, if there is you know, high mass or something like that, you have to make sure that you should, um, if possible, always fly above um, these terrain features. And also what you have to take into account um, are these flight restrictions. But with this, you can basically set yourself an altitude. Then you have to do, decide on the flight speed, how fast you want to fly. This is mainly uh, driven by the frontal overlap that you want to have and um, by the um, you know, interval that you can take pictures. Um, the SWOT width, this is the side overlap. So this is basically the distance uh, between two parallel uh, lines. If you have this uh, Mandarin flight path, as I said before, um, this is going to be set by the, um, yeah, by the decision of your side overlap. And then you have to decide, you know, how much batteries do I have? How much flight time do I have? And where do I need to stand so that I can always maintain a direct light of sight uh, for my operations? And of course, one thing that you have to take into account once you're inside is the weather. So just wanna talk a little bit about um, some aspects about weather um, because that's something that's like, you know, very variable in the Arctic and it can change very quickly. So it's just like a few words um, about that. Um, the first one is, is visibility. And this can be sometimes tricky um, because if you have low hanging clouds, it can be very difficult to sometimes tell how high they are. And it can be very, can very easily happen that you fly 120 meters um, and you suddenly hit the clouds. And again, if you hit clouds, then, well, you will not see your drone anymore. You have a risk of flying into icing conditions. Um, and, well, you're not going to see anything. You can't do your work. So there's something that you need to take um, into account and, like, always uh, monitor in a way. Um, rain and snow are also a problem. Um, these drones are not really built to fly in, in, in rain. Um, usually, if there's like a light, very light drizzle, then that's, um, they, they can sustain that, but I would not uh, want my drone exposed in, in those conditions. So if I see that it's starting to rain, I usually bring the drone back um, because it's going to give a lot of problems and, um, you know, we can have a short circuit somewhere. Uh, the, the, these drones are not really um, designed in a way that they're completely water, waterproof. Um, and snow, again, if you have snow, you have the risk of icing. So that's absolutely a, um, a condition where you shouldn't fly. Um, high wind speeds, again, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, in the module before. So also something to keep always a lookout um, is how does the drone behave? How much wind do you have? And this can be also in a practical term, sometimes really, really difficult to, to assess. Yeah? Sometimes you're standing in a valley or you're standing in kind of a wind shelter position yourself while um, above you, there might be really, really high wind speeds with your drone. So it's always kind of um, a good idea if you start flying to, you know, use your drone to like, you know, fly up to the altitude where you want to be above you and just like see how the drone behaves um, and see if there's a lot of wind happening. And of course, to use forecasts. And, and that leads to the question, so actually, you know, <laughs> what's actually good weather for flying? Um, and, you know, this is like two pictures, um, two different glaciers. Uh, which one is the better weather to, to, to do my field work? Um, and yeah, so on the right picture, we have a lot of sun, which is really nice for, you know, being outside, um, but actually it has a problem because this generates a lot of shadows. Um, so, you know, the shadows are then gonna be something that shows up in your pictures. And if you do your structure from motion technique, then um, the software might think that this is actually a feature and will try to track it. And of course the shadows can change. So if you do that, you're actually not gonna, you know, your 3D model will then suddenly have some kind of uh, artificial um, elements that are, um, indicated by, by shadows. So uh, what you kind of, ideally what you want is the conditions on the left where you have like this diffuse light, um, which is giving you an equal illumination of your scene, um, which is then gonna give you a very nice uh, 3D model. Um, and of course, this is a little bit in contrast to, you know, what you need for your field work and what you might uh, want as, a, as an operator um, and also as a, as a, you know, from a field work, field work point of view, um, uh, you know, getting to these places, if there's like, you know, diffuse light um, could be, you know, you could get into a whiteout and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how these um, uh, requirements of what is a good weather for you um, are a little bit opposite. And this is also kind of a very tricky situation. Um, if you have this kind of, um, you know, the sun coming through the clouds, um, then it's like illuminating some parts of the, 
um, you're seen very brightly, other, others are in shadows. This is also changing very quickly. So this can also lead to some situation where you'll run into uh, pro problems in your, in your post-processing um, uh, steps. And then again, the question is like, okay, but so does it mean I can't fly if there's any sun? Again, it depends on what's, your, what's the goal of your, your work, okay? Um, if you are you know, looking at larger structures, um, probably sun will not be a major problem for it. But if you look at, you know, um, at finer details, if you need a very high resolution of some things, then yeah, by all means, it means that if it's uh, good, nice weather to be outside, it might not be a good, um, it might not be a good, uh, yeah, time for you to fly. Okay, so does this mean that we're ready to go? I think we talked about a lot of, we made a lot of flight planning things. Um, and I think we might be almost ready, except we should do one thing. And that's a risk assessment. Um, and it's a little bit of an, an annoying thing, I think, uh, to always have this risk assessment, but it's also a very, very useful tool. Um, and this is gonna really help you uh, be prepared um, if you get into a scenario that you do not expect. And from my personal experience, I can tell you, like no matter how much you prepare, you always, you know, find something that, uh, you know, that happens unforeseen. And just to you know, be, pre be prepared for those couple of things that you can prepare for will help you immensely if you want in the situation um, that something happens. So if you plan your field work, if you plan your, your flights, I think it's, it's very um, nice thing to just do a very, very basic risk assessment. And these have not to be complicated. Um, if you want to do this, I would recommend just, you know, do a very simple, you know, have like four columns <clears throat> and think of these things of like, you know, what can go wrong? What's the scenario? And if this goes wrong, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for my operation? Um, then figure out like how likely is this to happen? And then what can I do to actually mitigate this? What can I do to avoid the situation? Or if I get into the situation, what can I do? Uh, so one example, okay, what can go wrong? I can lose my GPS signal. Um, what does it mean? Well, it means that I don't know my drone is and I potentially can't find my, find my way home. So I'll run out of battery and I just like crash somewhere uncontrolled because I don't know where my drone is. Um, how likely is this? Hmm, I think if this is not very unlikely if you um, operate in the, in the Arctic uh, areas. How can you mitigate it? Well, again, you need to make sure that you always have eyes on your drones. Um, you can try to have, you know, the video feed that you get from the camera if you have that op option to find your way home. And um, yeah, so that could kind of mitigate it. Another thing, this is something that happened to me. I was flying my drone, suddenly, uh, more or less out of nowhere, a rescue hel helicopter uh, appears flying at very low altitude. Um, so what can, uh, what does it mean? So this means that there's a you know, high risk uh, of collision with the aircraft. Um, which would be a really bad consequence. Um, how likely is it? Well, it's not very likely that the helicopter is going to fly exactly where you're going to be. Um, but how, what can I do to, to mitigate it? Um, well, if you hear a helicopter approaching, land immediately. Um, and also, in general, it's very nice to have a second person with you that is actually, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the drone, um, that's also keeping an eye on the surroundings for you. Um, so to have a spotter is actually a really nice um, uh, thing to bring along. And then, you know, we shouldn't forget that we are still uh, operating the Arctic. So there's a lot of uh, Arctic specific uh, risks that we need to, to take into account. Like, you know, what actually happens if you, you know, fly a drone and polar bear shows up. Um, suddenly, you know, then uh, you don't want his lunch. So um, even though it's not very likely to happen, you should definitely have a polar bear grad. Or actually, I can't say that. So it was just uh, last week, an incident on Svalbard. So um, in any way, you should always have a polar bear guard with you, um, at least when you do uh, drone operations uh, on, on Svalbard. So when I do it, when I plan my field work, I really like to have like a three person team <clears throat> going out. Um, we have one pilot who flies a drone, one spotter who's um, helping the pilot to keep an eye on the drone, who's like, um, you know, having binoculars and like always being aware of the whereabouts of the drone. And then I have a third person um, who's just, um, you know, looking out for polar bears um, and uh, preparing some, some lunch maybe. <laughs> So this risk assessment, you can then just like um, kind of rate things in, in terms of like how severe is the outcome, you know, um, and how is it, you know, is it a small inconvenience or is, you know, somebody potentially going to die? How likely is it going to happen? Um, and this can be like a very, very simple thing. Like just do a three by three matrix and just try to identify for yourself, like what's the most dangerous things. Um, and that will make you also feel much more confident um, when you go out in the field. 
So risk assessments. OK, so then how do we actually do the flight planning, right? So we need some kind of a software to do this. Um, and um, there is actually a wide, a wide uh, range of, uh, of softwares out there in the market that you can use for this. Um, there is, um, uh, and again, now I'm, I'm mainly focusing on this kind of like DJI type of, of drone missions. Um, so the, the DJI has its own software, the DJI Mission Planner. Um, then something called the DJI Flight Planner, which is not uh, provided by DJI. Um, then there's more commercial tools like Pix4D um, or Drone Deploy. And all of these, you know, there's like a wide range of these things. Some of these are um, intended for commercial applications. For example, Pix4D, um, it's uh, not just a flight planning tool, but it's also a photogrammetric tool. So which is then going to, you know, process your pictures into um, a 3D model. Uh, it's very commercial mindset. Uh, I think it's quite expensive. Um, uh, but I think the academic licenses, I, I actually heard the academic licenses are not that bad. Um, in any way, it has the flight planning part of the software. That's, for example, for free. So you can still use that to, to plan your flights um, uh, accordingly. So I, I don't have a, a, a strong recommendation what to, you, to use. I think all of these tools have their advantages and disadvantages. In the end, it kind of comes down to, is there something available at your university? What kind of uh, deals can you get on the licenses? Um, and then how, how much of a planning do you need to do? And what kind of like features is, is important for your own field work. But just to give you like a, a rough idea of how this is, um, how this is looking in, in real life, um, I can show you uh, one of the tools, one of the several tools that I'm using um, because it's a very, you can show it very nicely in the computer. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, something, a software called DJI Flight Planner. Um, and uh, it's uh, very convenient because it's, um, it uses uh, Google Maps as a, as a base map. So you can just like, you know, find your area of, uh, of interest, which uh, in my case, it would be uh, a glacier. Let's take this nice um, tuna brain glacier. And, um, you know, when you use this map immediately, what you notice is, um, or when you work with glaciers, you always have the problem that, you know, glaciers are not static in, <laughs> in, in time and space, so they move. So you have to be like very careful um, to um, actually know where your glacier is really is. And uh, um, uh, it's always a good idea to um, use uh, recent satellite pictures uh, to make a plan. So once you've identified the area um, that you want to, to, uh, to survey, uh, typically what you can then do is you can, you know, draw uh, some kind of polygon that is denoting the area that you're interested in. And you say like, okay, so this is the, the area I want to fly in. Um, and then all of these tools then have some kind of um, selections that you have to make uh, on, for example, what kind of um, drone are you using or what kind of camera are you using? That's really the main question here. So if I'm using uh, my Phantom Pro, um, then this has basically, you know, stored all the information about the focal length, uh, the size of the camera, um, um, and the pixel size, um, basically all the information that we need to, to calculate um, the ground sample distance, which you can say, see here. And then you can just adapt basically um, uh, all these parameters. So uh, you can prescribe a ground sample distance, or I want to say like, okay, uh, the highest I can fly is maybe uh, 400 uh, feet above the ground, which is um, 120 meters. Um, and then you see all the information. What is your forward overlap? What is the side overlap? Um, which is then resulting in the, in the distance between the, um, the lines. And um, yeah, so let's, for example, say, okay, I'm, I just want like a rough mapping of the area so I can live with a quite low uh, forward and side overlap. So it means that I need to take a picture approximately every six seconds and um, I can f have my flight lines 160 meters apart from each other. And then the next thing is then sometimes the, the tool does this automatically. Oh, this was maybe a bad idea. Um, but then you just like, you know, this is like the lines that you see here. This is uh, the flight lines. And then you need to find out like, how do you want to orient them? Like, how do you want your pattern to fly? Um, 
so sometimes so this is very nice because like it shows you kind of <laughs> uh, shows you very clearly you can play around with this and you can set the lines as you want um, but um, when when you make these five plans it's also important for you to decide so where where are you going to stay okay so in in this case um, you're probably going to be in a oh I'm sorry not sure what happened now um, in this case, you're probably going to be on a boat, for example, in front of the glacier. So um, then you want to, your, your drone maybe to fly in a way that it flies um, in, in parallel lines to the glacier surface. I'm not sure why it disappeared now, I'm sorry. Uh, let's do this one more time. Uh, So, um, so the, again, the question is, is like, you know, in which angle do you want your flight paths to be, flight paths to be? So typically, I would say this is maybe suboptimal. What I would uh, rather have is something uh, where um, the flight lines are in parallel to the glacier, because the drone is like getting further and further away from me, um, which makes it easier for me to access, like, where's the point where I can't see it anymore, or um, you know, I'm losing connection or something like that in, in a safe way. Right. So these tools are not very difficult to operate. And once you get an understanding of what, what like the different parameters mean and how they affect your data, I think this is very simple to do. So um, I'm not going to uh, um, I'm not going to uh, go too much into this. Um, again, there's a you know, bunch of uh, these, uh, these tools. Um, some are free again, or some elements of it are free. Um, for others, you have to pay um, and uh, yeah, depending on what you, what you use can be kind of expensive or, or not. Okay. All right. So going back a little bit um, to the idea in the beginning that uh, what, I want to do, what I wanted to do with this is to um, yeah, give you the tools and give you an understanding to do um, field work um, with drones in the Arctic. So, that leads to the question, so okay, so now we know how to do this. So now how do I get a drone actually to do all of this? So what's about the infrastructure? Um, and, um, you know, very easy, you know, thing to do. So I can, you can just like buy one of these drones. Um, they're not super expensive. So uh, it might very well be that uh, your research institution has a couple of, maybe you can buy some, uh, you can buy one for your project. Um, but actually, you don't need to do that because there's a lot of nice uh, institutions around that actually want to help you to do this work. Uh, one of which you've maybe heard of uh, is SIOS, uh, who are, of course, organizing this committee. And they have um, uh, quite a lot of uh, drone infrastructure um, that you can uh, basically um, you know, apply for some funding to, to get this. And you can actually also uh, apply for uh, you know, a way that you get a pilot with you or somebody who's uh, experienced and who can help you with that. So um, SIOS, again, it's a very great um, yeah, supplier for, for the services. Um, and I think it's a quite, quite a low entry way to, to get access to these kind of technologies and also kind of the knowledge that's behind it. Um, so you see here, they have a, you know, a, a selection of, um, of drones that they can use. Um, one of them even has a um, thermal camera, which is really nice. And I have heard some rumors that um, maybe sometime in the future we'll get access to uh, one of these uh, RTK drones, which would be really, really interesting for a lot of mapping purposes. Um, and then, of course, uh, the big, uh, you know, logistics supplier and fieldwork supplier and on Svalbard is, is UNIS. So UNIS and SIOS, they're kind of um, together. But in general, if you're a student at UNIS or if you do some fieldwork at UNIS, um, you can also have access uh, to their platforms. You can rent them uh, from this uh, UNIS drone group. Um, this is uh, basically more or less uh, very similar or actually the identical, identical drones um, that you can get from UNIS. Um, and there's a couple of, you know, just things that you need to, to know about. Like you can't just come and, uh, you know, do your drone work and you need to fill out some kind of uh, um, mission acceptance forms that are gonna where you have to describe what kind of uh, missions you're gonna fly. Um, and they need to be approved by, by UNIS and maybe they um, insist that somebody comes along um, but yeah, um, but I think with this, basically, you know, you have the means of planning your field work, uh, you know, what's important. Um, we have means of getting your drone. So that means that, yeah, you're ready. Um, and you can go out and, 
you can fly your drones and uh, you can do your work and uh, you know <laughs> do some kind of like you know crazy things with your drone take a lot of pictures have a lot of fun um it's it's very fun field work in a way um and then uh, after you're done yeah what happens then so let's talk about that for a little bit because um uh, part of the things that i'm um doing is i'm writing uh, like a small report for for SIOS, where we're trying to analyze um, the use of drones on Svalbard. And uh, one thing that we noticed, um, and this is by no means uh, a, a phenomenon only for drones, but in particular, is that you know people go out, they do field work, and they get all this um, really, really interesting data, and then maybe they write a paper for, out of it or, or a thesis. Um, and then you know they use some of the data, but not everything. And in a couple of years, you know, where's this data stored? It's stored in your computer. And then it uh, disappears, and that's really sad. So, I want to talk to you about uh, data management, <laughs> which I know is uh, in a in a when I just say data management, it's not the most sexy topic. It's a little bit boring, uh, but I don't think so actually. And I think it's actually really really important. And like one really good uh, reason why you know having a good data management and data source system is really important is if you think of um, some of the things that we use today, which comes from the olden days. And I think. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potential for, for, for things to be reused in the future that maybe right now you can't even foresee. And my favorite example is, is you know, when they compare these like aerial photographs from, I don't know, back in the you know, 50s or 60s of you know, how the glacier has looked and how the glacier looks today. Um, this is only possible because there was some guy who you know, made sure that there's a long-term storage of this data and this is data is actually, these pictures are gonna be available to the public, all right? So if you do some field work today, you don't even, you have one specific application in your sense, probably something that's rather short term, um, but you don't even know uh, maybe now of how this data might become useful in the future. So um, I think if you think about it, like, hey, what I'm doing, it's not just interesting for me, but it could be interesting for, for you know, future generations or future scientists. Um, maybe if you have that mindset, then you become more motivated to, to make sure that um, you don't store your, your software, uh, sorry, your, 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 um, your data on your computer somewhere, but you try to find, you know, a centralized and an open access storage, yeah? Um, there's actually a lot of, um, uh, I think this data management is becoming a very big issue um, in, in the community, in, in science community in general. Um, and there's a lot of like very interesting um, services by different people who offer you kind of a, you know, cloud um, solution where you can put your data, you can have different kind of access um, uh, um, different kind of access uh, schemes for it, um, but all of them is like aimed for like you know long-term storage. This is uh, data which usually like they um, uh, you know guarantee you the data is going to be available for like 50, 60 years or something like that. So I think this is really important. And um, one important thing with this is, is it's not just like that you put your data there, but you also put some description of like you know how we've done that. If you ever try to look up the code of somebody of uh, you know code or like some products or uh, results that somebody else generated and you try to recreate it then you always have this like oh my god what did they do there and then you can spend uh, a formidable amount of time to kind of figure out how some result has been done. So um, not only store your data but also report how you do that. So for example, when we talk about you know making a map, making a 3D model, um, it's not enough that you share the model. I think it's also nice that you share the pictures that you base your model on. But at the very least, you should have some kind of a report, some kind of description, description of how you generated the data. What kind of um, specific you know structure for motion technique have you used? If you use a software, what kind of um, parameters have you set? Um, you don't maybe need to explain even why you've chosen them so much. Um, although you should always have a good reason, as we'll see in the hands-on later. But it's just like nice to to have a way um, for other people to understand what you've done. It will give just that much more um, value to to your data for you, but also for for future scientists. So you know, don't be that guy who just like you know does his research um, and disappears. You know, like nobody likes that guy. Um, so uh, I think a good talking point to to get started in this like talk to your local librarian. Um, these people have like amazing archives um, where you can store data for a really long time uh, or university or institute might have a data person. Um, I believe Sios uh, really thinks that this is a big issue as well. So um, 
uh, keep an eye out. I'm sure there's going to be some some activities and lectures about um, data management uh, in the future. Um, and I really, really like yeah, strongly encourage that. It's you know so much work going on. Let's make sure that the work doesn't go unnoticed and it can benefit as much people as we as we can. All right. Okay. Coming uh, coming to an end, basically. Um, just want to su summarize um, this module's uh, uh, main points. So you know, before you go out in the field, like plan each of your missions really, really carefully. Be aware of what you want to do, why you want to do it, what is your result going to look like, and then plan around it. Um, and it may see, you know, one of the biggest things you need to decide, like how much is, what is the resolution that I, I need? Um, how big of an overlap do I need to have? Do I need ground control points? Can I live without? Um, when you go out, what kind of weather conditions are you going into? Is this good for mapping? Is it going to be a problem for my results? Um, and always be aware of the risks and make a risk assessment um, and make sure that you do everything in a, in a, in a safe way uh, to your own personal safety, but also the safety of the drone and you know, the equipment that you're going to use. And whenever you can, use shared infrastructure, share your infrastructure if you can. Um, there's uh, a lot of opportunities for that, uh, especially here on Svalbard. And last uh, but not least, um, yeah, think about really documenting and, and sharing your results to the public in a way that it can be reused by other people. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, I have, there's a couple of questions and uh, I'm not sure where my mouse is. So let me, let me maybe just go through um, the questions that are here and then I have a quick announcement about the, the exercise this afternoon. So question, ba, 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 ba. Uh, is there anyone or technology that can inspect your flight height? So somebody's asking, is there anyone or a technology that can inspect your flight height? I'm not sure if I understand. I, I guess like you wonder if there's somebody who's controlling your flight height um, in, in height side. Um, yes. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, you, you might be actually... Um, if you register as a, as a drone pilot um, and you know you, you're being caught in the, f in the field and somebody's um, uh, suspecting that you know you might have violated the airspace, uh, this data is stored on your drone, for example. Um, so they can actually you know take the drone and they can uh, they can require you to uh, to provide this data and then this is documented there, so they actually can see that. Um, but this is, is this is not done on a uh, on a, on a regular basis. But then again, if you want to publish your data and then you have to write that, yeah, well, I took this data at an altitude of, you know, 1,000 meters, then people might ask some questions. Um, so in, in, in it's not that difficult to get um, some exemptions from these regulations. And again, if you talk with partners like UNIS or, or SIOS, they can definitely help you to um, get beyond this, uh, these restrictions, especially like this 120 meter flight altitude. I know that's a bit annoying. Um, and often you want more, and that's something that can be um, actually relatively easily be done. Um, ba, 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 ba. And then somebody asks, is DJI flight plan a freeware? Uh, no, I think it's not, or I know it's not. Uh, it's something that's a, it's a license, um, but it's not very expensive. Um, yeah. Then somebody asks, what are these classes, RO2? Oh yeah, so I didn't want to get too much into detail, but this is basically how the regulations are built up. So RO1, that's the, um, that's the basic, the open class, um, the one that we discussed here mostly, where you don't need any special training to, to be allowed to fly them. And then as soon as you want to fly something uh, uh, of a higher class, um, either it's a bigger drone or it's uh, an operation which is uh, you know, exceeding this, for example, the 120 meters altitude limits, um, then it becomes a R RO2 um, operation. But this is the old Norwegian rules, which are going to be obsolete by December. So that's why I didn't want to talk to you about. In the new EU system, it's called, uh, I think it's called specific operations, and it's going to be very similar. And then somebody said, thank you for the excellent lecture. Well, thank you very much. And um, thank you for these good questions. One uh, long question. Um, somebody's asking, it seems like I still do not understand how well SFM DM are, create, are created using photogrammetry in visible spectrum, unlike radars. And are point elevation areas between ground control points interpolated? Um, 
so again, a ground control point is just a feature, like a very specific feature that you put into a scene where you know the, 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 the geometry. I think what you're asking is, um, uh, it's maybe like a tracked feature. So, um, and the answer is yes. Like you have a lot of tracked features uh, in, in a scene. This can be like, you know, like the edge of the cast that we've seen or like a, a specific, you know, rock or something like that, that the software automatically identifies. This is a feature and it tracks it across various um, pictures. And, um, and hopefully you can join the, the, um, the hands-on. I think it's gonna be quite clear when, when we do there. And then this is then the point. And you're <laughs> fully right that in between two points, you make an, you make an interpolation. You, you say like, okay, between these two points, there's probably just a, you know, just a regularly interpolated area in between. And then you can even project like your, one of the, the images on it. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully this is gonna be a little bit more clear in the, in the hands-on. So um, what are some of the assets asking, what are the most popular and cheap software complexes for processing SFM images uh, to create autophoto in 3D? Um, I think, I believe the, um, um, I believe the only free version that has, um, that, that, that is, can, you know, that there's something to write about is, is this Micmac, which uh, Luke, I think, uh, used yesterday. Um, that's an open source uh, software that can be used for photogrammetry. Um, and it's actually quite powerful uh, in some ways. I have never used it myself, um, um, but I know it's maybe not as, um, as, uh, as easy to use as the um, arguably biggest supplier uh, of uh, structure for motion uh, methods, and that's uh, Agisoft uh, Metashape, um, which is uh, what we're gonna use in the uh, hands-on session today. Um, that's a, a commercial uh, software. You can get like a one month uh, free trial for that. Um, a lot of universities um, uh, have, have, a, have this uh, license and you can use it, um, um, but it's, it's fairly expensive. So that's definitely, um, but it's, it's a very easy to use tool as we'll see this afternoon. And if you wanna try it out, there's a, you know, a free trial license. 